testing, 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 one, two, three. Welcome back everybody to another Friday night live stream here at Christ Center Ironworks. Hopefully everyone is doing well this evening. Uh, we've got a special guest in the house, well, in the forge once again. Uh, it is the illustrious, the one and only, Thomas, the hand model. He is back. <laughs> And creepier than ever. So, <laughs> he had my whole body in his hands. Oh. <laughs> so, anyway, so how you doing this evening, Jessica? I'm doing good. Yeah. yeah. We have a good, uh, good group going on here. Good, good. Got a ton of people in the shop this evening. We do. Uh, 68 for now. 68 for mm -hmm. now. Right on. Right on. So, uh, in tonight's stream, we're gonna switch it up a little bit. I'm gonna take a break. Well an even longer break from the pot rack type deal that we were working on. And tonight we're actually going to work on forging a wrought iron ax and uh, in roughly a Scandinavian style. So we're gonna make a wrought iron ax with a forge welded in, 1045 bit into it. Also, this is our giveaway live stream that we do once a month. We do a one giveaway live stream a month. And in this stream, we are going to be giving away a Holland Anvil Swedge Block for the year of the Swedge. That's what we call it affectionately here on the channel if you haven't been here before. And we will also be giving away a lot of great other tools. We've got some Tom Tongs to give away from Blacksmith Supply. They were generous enough to donate those to us. Uh, I've also got some Tong Blanks to give away. That, w that we personally bought from Ken's Custom Iron. And when I say we personally, I mean the community, you all, the supporters that have been super chatting and, and uh, helping Jessica and I and the channel members, they purchased that. So give them a round of applause down in the comment section down below. And then we also have some blacksmithing blanks to give away and a Kiradashi from Wiley, Wiley Rook Blade Works. So, uh, so we've got a lot of good stuff to give away in the stream. It's gonna be relaxing, it's gonna be fun. We're gonna make Thomas the hand model sweat. <laughs> I'm just gonna direct and it's all gonna be all right. <laughs> so hopefully everybody will enjoy the stream this evening. I already got a piece of material hot. It's a piece of strap. Uh, I don't know what it came off of. It's wrought iron, it's old. I do know that it's roughly an inch and a half wide by five eighths of an inch thick. So whatever that is in metric, any of my uh, European friends or other p countries across the world, they can do the math for metric for me mm -hmm. in the comment section. <laughs> <laughs> Drop it in there. So I'm going to have this thing get good and hot, and we'll get right into this post haste. All right. Without further ado, what we got? Well, while it's heating up, I'd like to say thank you, Stephen Watkins, for the $5 super chat. He says, happy Friday, everyone, from Myth Minion Smithy. It's party time at CCI. Woohoo! Thank you, Minion Smithy. Thank you. Also, Lynette Masala, thank you for the $5 super chat. Thank you, Lynette. Is it Lynette? Mm-hmm. Okay. Thank you. And also, we have a brand new member, Blacksmith Shop Help, uh, Bama Tony. Bama Tony, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much for becoming a channel member. It really does help, and it helps to go a long way towards shipping out all these giveaway items. Also, I might have forgot to mention at the beginning, Holland Anvil, they donated the swedge block, and they have donated, what's this, number 10. Mm -hmm. This is swedge block number 10. So, so far, they, they, you know, they helped donate a portion of the proceeds of the swedge box that made it cheaper for us to be able to purchase them so we could give them away during our live streams. So be sure to go check them out. And uh, this is swedge block number 10 this year. So we only got two more, November, December. And uh, I was actually talking to them recently at Quad State and we're gonna do something really flashy for December. So mm -hmm. stay tuned for yep. the great Christmas giveaway live stream. So. Mm -hmm. I'm super excited. <laughs> Few hellos, Baldwin Forge, The Baca Maker, Board to Gov, Eddard Stark, Christopher Conkright, Jeremy W, Jose Martinez, 
Hello, Alex hello, Smith. hello. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of people in here. Hello to all. Let's see. Thank you, Jeff Barquet, for the $5 super chat. Thank you, Jeff. Jarvis says, hello, Roy. I saw you over on Glenn's channel, GS Songs. Yeah, that was a fun little stream. Let's see here. Um, somebody asked, ah, Alex Pittman says, I don't deserve the swedge, but I would like to know what would be a good substitute for a swedge block. For a swedge block? Mm -hmm. What's a good substitute? Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you don't have space for a swedge block or if you don't have maybe the cash to go out and just buy a swedge block, a great substitute is to make your own hardy hole mounted or anvil mounted swedges. They're not super hard to do. They all start with the same basic principle of having basically a lunk of steel that you either carve, hammer in, uh, you know, punch, whatever you have to do to put whatever type of groove that you want to put into it and then either weld on a hardy shank or forge that as one piece. So that would be my uh, recommendation. Uh, there is fabricate, there is cause to have fabricated swedge blocks as well, where you can fabricate, you know, say like if you just need the V's, right? You can cut, you can cut you off a piece of angle iron or three pieces, stack them together where you got a V in the center and weld them up and you can make a welded together thing, a fabricated one. So there's a lot of different ways of uh, going about getting a swedge block. <laughs> All right, this is good and hot. Let's go ahead and get to work, okay? All right. So let's go to camera number two. Okie dokie. Gosh, my Zom, thank you for the $5 super chat. Thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Gonna find my, there it is. All right, let's go light. It's rot, so there's no need to kill it. Whoa. Good. Set this down off to the side. You want to cool this off for me? Welcome new members, Mr. B, uh, Bachomp, Bachomp, and also Jay Meska. Welcome, welcome. Glad to have you all here. All right, so are we still on channel number two here? Yep. <coughs> All right, so this was a piece, I don't know what it was off of. I, I think it was off of a piece of old farm equipment or something like that. Uh, they had one in that was threaded and tapered, but the threads had rotted off a long time ago. So we're gonna take advantage of this pre-bend already that's there in the piece versus trying to cut it off and then we still have to bend it anyhow. I'm just taking advantage of what somebody else's, some sweat equity that's already been in inputted into the piece. So now we're going to go ahead and heat this up and I'm going to brush it real good. And the reason why you want to brush old wrought iron really good uh, is you don't know what it's been coated with. And a lot of times, like it, say if it was like bridge steel or things of that nature, a lot of times it had lead in the paint and it had some other junk in there that Again, if you were trying to get a good weld on this, it's gonna inhibit your weld when you go to try to forge weld because of all the junk uh, from years of road grime, debris, you know, stuff like that, that collects on the surface. So we're gonna get it hot again. I'm gonna brush it down real good and clean uh, before we start kind of bending this, uh, forging out the lips here to prepare it for our weld, for our bit. Christopher? Uh, it's kind of like a bird's mouth weld. Yeah. 
Christopher Conkright says, how strong is a wrought iron axe? Very strong. So uh, strength, is, strength is relative and proportional to what you're trying to achieve, right? Uh, you can get something that's hard and brittle, or you can get something that's hard and tough. Two totally different things. Depends on what you're trying to go after. If you're trying to make a, say, maybe like a wood chisel, but some that's never going to be struck, something that's like a push chisel, right? You want it to be hard. So this way you can sharpen that thing to razor sharp, and it just holds an edge for what feels like forever, right? That's, that's what you want. Uh, in a hammer, however, you don't want it that hard. You're going to snap it. Or a spring, you don't, want a, you don't want a spring to be hard. You want it to be tough or springy, right? Uh, same thing with a hammer. You want it to be tough, if you will. So wrought iron, wrought iron, even though the body of the axe, if you will, or hatchet or whatever you're making out of it, is going to be soft, the bit is just as good, the high carbon steel bit, is as good a material as you put into it. So you put 1095 in there, it's gonna be able to harden up like 1095 or 4140 or 1045 or uh, 5160, whatever, whatever it is that you throw, throw together there as the high carbon bit, you can take advantage of those properties. Now with an ax, you don't really want a hard, super hard tool. You want something that can take an edge very quickly and easily, and something that, you know, if you hit, if you hit a nail that just happens to be in a chunk of wood, right, as you're chopping on it, because somebody decided to have a fence there at one time, it doesn't end up chipping out the edge of your blade, right? So you want it to be hard enough to resist, you know, dulling but you don't want it to be so hard to where it shatters or chips in use because it is a still an impact tool. It may be a cutting tool, but it's not a fine cutting tool. It's, a, it's still an impact tool. You're swinging it, whap. It, it needs to be able to hold up. Hopefully I answered that mm -hmm. in good enough detail. Yes, you did. Uh, All right. See, we had another member join as well. Thank you to all the new members. Greatly appreciate it. And we will have you added to our membership wall. Yes, that's right. Uh, Jeff Parkett, Barkett. Jeff Barkin? Barkett just joined. Marquette? Barkett with a B. Barkett. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jeff. As well did the Gaming Ham. The Gaming Ham? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Greatly appreciate that. God bless you all for the support. And Dana says, it's time to start thinking about new Christmas stickers. <laughs> yes, yep. we all have to start brainstorming that. That's right. Let's go to camera number two. All right. We'll go ahead and brush this up. I'm going to walk behind you for a second, Roy. Go grab some safety glasses. All right. All I'm trying to do is just get the junk that has sat on the surface of this material for the last hundred years off. I'm not trying to clean it up for a weld. I'm not trying to do anything like that. I'm not trying to grind it clean. I'm just trying to brush off that surface junk that was on there. Now, I did mention that old rot, a lot of times, like bridges and stuff, they had lead paint in them. And that is something health-wise you need to watch out for or need to be cognizant of. Um, people say, well, you know, oh, once you get sick from that or this or that, like, in my shop, I, <laughs> I just don't inhale. We can go back to camera number one, Jess, if you're there. All right. <coughs> In, in my shop, I don't inhale. I don't sit over my, uh, I don't sit over my forge and breathe in whatever's coming out. I've got a fairly big shop. It's very arid in my shop, uh, so I don't worry about it myself. You may want to, and in which case you may want to use some sulfuric acid or something like that. Or I've been told uh, 
probably gonna have to do some sulfuric acid and wear a respirator and wire wheel the thing clean at some point to get the lead off of there. To strip the paint. That's why we don't use the forge to roast marshmallows. Exactly. <laughs> That's why we don't roast marshmallows on the forge. As tasty as of an option that may be. Eric oh. says, is Roy feeling okay? This is a project that is sharp and a little pointy. <laughs> there is no pointy. <laughs> no pointy, good sir. <laughs> oh. Robert Whitney, it was good getting to meet you at Quad State as well. I'm glad to see you back in the live stream. Yeah, Robert, it's great meeting you. It's great meeting everybody that went to Quad State. It was, it was really was a good time. That's my favorite part of Quad State is getting to meet up with all these people. All the screen names. And then trying to put a face to the screen name. <laughs> uh. Bortagov says, who is the striker today? I missed that part. It is Thomas, the illustrious hand model. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Love model at the moment. <laughs> I reckon I'll probably yep. show my face again. He he he, he 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 has a face for radio. <laughs> well, that too. <laughs> Let's go to camera number two, Jess. All right. We're gonna go right over the horn, Thomas. Oh. Really short blunt taper. Yeah. Hold up. Let me put this it's back. To Go ahead. A little bit. It's good. It's cracking out. Won't matter. It's going to get welded. Okay. So. This is actually my first time working with rock. So. Now at this point, although it may still look hotter than Hades on camera, this is really where you ideally want to stop working wrought iron. You do not want to keep hammering it down into temperatures like this, trying to change its shape. Because if you do, it'll split on you each and every time. Wrought iron likes to be worked hot. And I mean hot. All right, so we got one end. Ah, use tongs, Roy. We got one end tapered out. Now we're gonna go ahead and dress this, which was, I don't know where that got cut off from. At one time, it got snapped off of something. That end, we're gonna drive that out and dress that taper out. Baron Ford says, howdy, howdy, howdy. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Back to camera one. Yep. All right. Do you all want to see a Thomas, the illustrious hand model's face? Even though it might scare small children, I'm going to have to cover their eyes. <laughs> we, this is totally where we need a sound effects board. Da -da -da. There he is. Evening, everyone. Right. Uh, see, we need a Foley artist that goes, Womp, womp, womp. <laughs> Somebody said he could be a beard model, too. Yeah, he could be a beard model. Yeah, I, I did get a haircut last night from you seeing me, too, though. Oh, look at I, that. I had to become a, a human again, though, for camera purposes. <laughs> <laughs> we let him know, like, a day in advance, like, 24 hours in advance notice. So he's like, I got to get a haircut. He went and saw a stylist. <laughs> The makeup department here at Chrysler and I work, spent an hour and a half getting them ready. <laughs> it's really why I have to stand this far away from cameras. Oh. Wilson from Home Improvement, this walker L in my face. Oh, oh yeah. just over the fence? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's excellent. 
Joel Davis sent a $5 super chat. Says, I have greatly appreciated all your videos. Been watching them for a while and learning as I go. Awesome. I'm so glad to hear that. Thank you for the $5 super chat. That's greatly appreciated. Also, Nicholas Sheritz sent a $100 super chat. Says, what? <laughs> I finally got time to watch. Great channel. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you for that $100 super chat. That will really, 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 really help out. All of them will. will. Oh, and one more from Jim Berkeley for $10. Says, what are you making, Roy? Thank you, Jim Berkeley. We are making a small axe. So, little Scandinavian style belt axe. Something you can take out in the woods with you. Um, if it turns out well, I'm thinking about making it for my son for Christmas. So, we'll see. I might give it to him for Christmas. He's been wanting to chop on wood and whittle on things and so it might be a might be the time to make him some tools of the trade there no i ain't making no knife no whittle at knives i'll go buy that but <laughs> axes i can do axes well i think i can do axes it's mainly an experiment so we we're working with wrought iron and 1045 for the bit that was very, very, very sporadic, and I apologize. <laughs> it was a sporadic answer. Christopher Faye says, one year today of watching live streams. Hey, hey. Well, thank you for sticking around, Christopher Faye. Greatly appreciate it. Toby Joe says, even and Roy and Jess, uh, haven't seen you for a while, been missing you. Good been evening, while. been missing you too. Oh, is that your? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, waiting on like I'm waiting whistle. on the hand model to get in get in the action here. So, <laughs> all right, are we ready We're now? Ready. Have I inter uh, Have I interrupted your 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 Twitter feed? Well, I was replying back to Troy. <laughs> okay. All right, let's go to the anvil. Same thing, really short blunt taper. Can I smash this hard? Oh. We're, we're gonna take just a bit more right up here. Whoa, light, light. Oh, that's good. Now this is a little bit weird than starting with a, say a straight piece, because we're doing these steps that would normally be done on a calculated amount of material, right? We're already doing it with a bend in the center of it, which is a bit odd, but uh, given the day and age that we're living in, right? Where steel has went up 450% as of late, this is a good exercise on making use out of scrap materials, right? And making them work for you no matter what their shape is. Blacksmiths have been doing it. There's nothing special about this. Blacksmiths have been doing it for hundreds of thousands of years that way. Making use of little end bits of scrap anywhere they can find it. One thing Grandpa ever said that there's no such thing as scrap pieces, just smaller pieces. <laughs> I like that, Thomas. So there you go. You can see we got that so far, right? So that's going to become, you can keep, you can keep there, Jess. That's okay. going to become the back of the wrap of the axe. That little bin that's already there. We're going to take advantage of that. Some of our work's already done for us when we wrap it around this drift here. More on the drift here in a bit. <laughs> Question from the Gaming Ham, AKA Gordon Farmer. Yeah. Says, need some advice on forging copper pipe. Is there any way of telling the temperature of it while it's in the forge? Um, 
the best thing I could tell you about copper, okay, especially if you're working with pipe in particular, I would suggest that you anneal the pipe, but don't forge it hot. Uh, copper is a very, has very low tensile strength as it is. And so if you work it while it's hot, it has even less tensile strength and you actually need the pipe to support itself somewhat as you neck it down, right? As you neck it down, it needs to kind of upset on itself and kind of self support. So it'd be my suggestion that you, that you anneal the pipe, bring it up to a dull orange in color and then, and then quench it. Not with the chimney effect, but sideways into your bucket. Grip it from the side and quench it down sideways. Not at, not end quench where it'll blow that steam right up at you. Then quench off that pipe and then work it from there. Uh, work it cold. It'll be much more controlled and it will go a lot better for you. Jeff Woodring says, with wrought iron, do you tend to lose more weight to forge scale than modern 1018 type steel? Um, not scale. So you're not losing it to scale. You are losing it to, as you work the rot, you're losing the silica that's in it, right? The sand, the impurities, the various things that are in the wrought iron that make it rot, that gives it them stringy like grains, right? those parts that are in between the grains of iron uh, that are really stringy. That's what you're squishing out. So it will put off a lot more scale. And so, yes, you do lose more mass out of that than you do a modern steel, um, where the grain structure is much more refined. Matthew Davidson says you have to keep raw iron close to welding temps, right? Yep. You want to keep it up. Where mild steel would normally start welding and sticking at, that's where the bottom end of forging temperature is for wrought iron. So you want to keep it hot, 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 hot. So, uh, and it depends on the operation that you're doing. If you're just cutting through it, doesn't matter. You could be down like a dull orange, um, down into your red temperature, that's fine. You can nick them and break them off and, and, and do all sorts of things with wrought iron there. Uh, punching a hole right? You want to start at a high temperature, you want to finish at a cool temperature uh, to get a really nice finish on it. But cool temperature for that, instead of mild steel, where you might be able to push it down into a black, you can't do that with rot. You can only do down to a dull orange finishing temperature for, through punching a hole uh, in wrought iron. The reason for that is that the temperature on so that grain will pop apart. So if you get it too cold, it acts like a wedge driving through a chunk of wood. Again, we have fibrous wrought iron. It'll split the wrought iron. It'll split the hole. So you have to keep it at a fairly high temperature. All right, let's go back to the anvil. All right. All right, Thomas, come out here. So what we're going to do now is I've got a little bottom fuller, just a round bar welded up to a square hardy shank. I've got that. See, you're probably going to set it like that. That'll be easier. Uh, I've got that in the hardy hole there. And what we're going to do is we're going to do some striking. I'm going to use a, uh, I'm going to use a flatter on top so we get a nice even hammer blow without a bunch of marks across the top. And we're going to put in a fuller, a fuller section here to separate our pole from the bit of our axe. You want these hard? All right. Um, we're going to go light at first. Okay. And we'll go a little harder. So I'm going to go about there. We got some swell going. All right, we can go just a little bit more on that. Okay. 
Good. Oh, come on, you. Well. That's good. So that's what we're after there. We're going to do that on this. We're going to do the same thing on the other side. I eyeball things. <laughs> so you may be thinking that looks a little small. Um, we're back to main cam. Stick with me, girl. All Stick right. with me. When we're done hammering, back to the main cam. Sound All good? Right. Yep. All right. Uh, you may be thinking that looks a little small in that area, but you have to understand right now, this is 5 eighths of an inch thick material, wrought iron. This is all going to get spread out and thinned out as we work it around the drift, as we do our forge welds, right? Everything is going to kind of change dimension. It's going to get spread out and thinned out a lot. Uh, for instance, the bit itself, it's 5 eighths inch thick on both sides. That's one, that's a splitting mall, right, coming together. So we can't have that. That's going to get all drawn out into the, you know, the bit of the axe, right, the blade and the bit of the axe. It's all going to get drawn out from that roughly two inch by two inch or inch and a half by inch and a half, if you will, by five eighths inch thick piece. Uh, so there's a lot more mass there than you think is what I'm getting at. And if you look at most axes, they're fairly thin around the eyes of the axe, and uh, they, they're a little thicker at the pole, but they're fairly thin around the eyes of the axe, and then they've got a nice long swooping taper to their blades, generally, depending on what type of axe we're talking about. Aimless Adventure says, what's the best way to crack iron while forging? Crack it? Yeah. Uh, best way to crack iron while forging is hit it while it's too cold. <laughs> <laughs> Jason Farthing says, I'm looking to get into blacksmithing as a hobby. You are the main blacksmith I watch online. Any suggestions you haven't already given? Hmm. Looking to get into it as a hobby? Mm -hmm. Yep. Not really. <laughs> I've got like, I've got so much information. <laughs> I've got so much information out there now. Um, yeah, uh, I would say only advice I could give you just directly is just get into it. Just get after it. Don't think about it. Just get in it. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of people will wait. They're waiting for the right time. They're waiting for the right move, the right moment. Um, the day's too hot. The day's too long. Uh, you know, they're, they're waiting for whatever reason it may be and well they end up waiting too long so to speak so uh, my advice is just get into it you know however you can wherever you can you don't have to have the perfect tools you don't have to have the best equipment you can ha start with a hole in the ground and a hair dryer and a dream in your heart mm -hmm. is it idea no it, is it ideal no it's not but we all start somewhere and you'll have a really wicked cool story of your beginning, if you will. So yeah, that would be my advice, just getting into it. Uh, stop watching, start doing. Jameson Ross says, what is the easiest and cheapest way to get wrought iron? Uh, the only way you can get wrought iron is the easiest and cheapest way, which is find it. So uh, luck into it, look for really old pieces uh, farm machinery that's out of commission or that'll never be put back in commission. Uh, and I do mean old, old stuff like pre 1900 era stuff. Um, yeah. Hook up with other blacksmiths, find out who's got little sources of them. There's some new wrought iron. There's some companies out there that are making, uh, re-rolling old wrought iron, turning it into new bars of wrought iron that you can purchase. But it's, uh, <laughs> I'd rather buy gold. It's pretty expensive. <laughs> Let's go to the anvil, Jess. All right. All right. Good and hot. <coughs> okay. 
We're good. He got the vid on me. No. You guys saw it here first. <laughs> Hold up. Mm -hmm. If I had to do this again, I would probably definitely. So we got a high side started there. So let's game it that way. You don't have to murder it. It's wrought iron. No murder, murder. <laughs> okay. Come on, you booger. Good. All right, there we are so far. We've got an interesting little shape starting. Can they see that all right, hon? Yep. Yeah. Uh-huh. <clears throat> Another thing I'd like to point out about working with wrought iron. Um, we are a bit sissified nowadays about like the quality of wrought iron, so to speak, or like our finished result has got to be perfect, free of all defects, 100% um, machine grade finish, right? And with wrought iron, where people uh, fail or think that they failed is wrought iron is an imperfect material. It is not made with uh, up-to-date sciences, uh, metallurgy, if you will, right? It is a bygone, it is a bygone material for a reason. There's a reason why mild steel won out. And I don't know if they can see that. Can they see that from that distance? Can you see that crack there? Mm, vaguely. So this is not a crack. This is a delamination. It's a delamination between the grains of the, of the actual iron. That's where too much silica or silicate has worked its way out. Sometimes I've even found in bars of wrought iron rocks, literal rocks inside the iron itself. So you've got to understand the material itself. So where you may make an ax, right? And I forged this and I forge welded it all together and all of a sudden you might see some, you might see a crack in the grain or see a little D lamb or something like that. That is perfectly natural in a historical context. It's something that they might have addressed with a little bit of extra welding. They might have brazed it shut and then filed it if it was really an eyesore. Otherwise, if it was on a piece of equipment, it was acceptable, right? It was like, well, that happened. It was not a failure of the material as it is a characteristic of the material. So that's something to keep in mind if you're going to work, uh, you know, if you're going to work wrought iron, you know, things like that. It is wildly different. Wrought iron is wildly different than our modern steels today. And the concept around it is different than what we have about our modern materials nowadays. Nowadays, if we say, oh, that's got rust on it. Dude, 200 years ago, they would have been like, so what? It's rusty. But today, it's like, oh, well, that's decaying. That's bad. That's whatever. Artists, we try to sell it as, no, that's patina. It's great. It's beautiful. Right? Machinists would say, that's horrible. That's causing pitting. You're losing 20 thousandths of material there. What are you doing? Right? Um, and, and we go through all this effort to prevent the rust and prevent all these things. 
And again, we have to remember that we are working in a very old, ancient craft. And a lot of the stuff now that we find unacceptable about our work is would have been perfectly normal and acceptable 200 years ago. And that comes from our day, uh, our, our time that we live in, our culture that we currently live in that is mass produced, machined, stainless steel stuff, right? So just like to point that out with you because a lot of people have misgivings about working with wrought iron and that's one of the reasons. They're like, oh, well I made this, this hammer and the hammer I split on it. Well, yeah, so that and like the thousands of other wrought iron hammers that were ever forged on the face of this earth prior to you ever working with the material. That's a normal occurrence. It's not something that's just gonna split open and it's just gonna destroy the hammer, right? Um, it's not a crack like in high carbon tool steel where that would be catastrophic, right? Because of in large grain structure, it's a property of the actual material that you're working with. Jeff Woodring says, Roy, on your flatter, what is the thickness of the flat plate? On the what? On the flatter, what, how thick is the flat plate part of it? Half an inch thick, 12 mil, 12 to 13 mil thick. Uh, Ari Milky says, greetings from Australia, Roy. Can you talk more about how drifts, uh, talk about drifts for axes and hammers? Uh, what would he like to know about those? That's a long subject. <laughs> <laughs> oh. yeah. uh, also, Go ahead. Something to share? Okay. Also, Chris Ackley says, Roy, um, are you now using blacksmith code when working with a striker? I've read that used to be a custom. Um, not really. In order, to develop, in order to develop that, you have got to work with somebody a really long time, right? And they've got to almost anticipate what you're wanting. Um, the, the only thing I'm saying that I'm using and that I taught Thomas to do with me in the shop, and like I will anybody who is working or striking for me, it, and it's kind of a universal thing, so it's pretty broad spectrum across the entire world, but is when my tooling, if you go to the anvil for a sec, Jess, mm -hmm. I got this piece kind of cooling down because we're going to do a giveaway here, and then... Uh, but I'm going to answer some questions while I got, we've been going pretty steady at. When my tooling, so we've got three components here, well, four, if you bring in Thomas's hammer, right? We've got the flatter on one hand. I'd rather this be a set hammer, but I don't have one with a broad enough face. We've got the flatter on one hand. We've got the piece to be worked in the tong in the other hand. We have a bottom tool that we're balancing it on, and then we have the hammer that's going to do the work, right? And all three of the, all four of those items need to come together in harmony. So I control three of them, striker controls one. So what I am essentially doing, and the way I've taught it, is when I've come to a dead still, when I'm dead still, that means strike, and he strikes. If I'm still kind of fluffing about here and adjusting and he gives me a big wail on something like that someone's going to get hurt my wrists are going to get jarred he's going to have a tool fly up in his face something like that right so if i need to change position when i'm doing something like this it's a strike right if i'm holding it, if he's hammering it and if i go like this that means stop hitting it right i've moved the tool away from the action and that can be previously discussed beforehand when you do it. Or I might come here. I don't need to talk because he knows when I, what am I doing? Am I just looking at it? Am I just like, oh, here, I just want this to cool down now. No, I want Thomas to work when I put the tool down and get it set solid. Take it away, get it readjusted. So he's waiting for that dead stop to supply the hammer work. So that is the blacksmith language that's going on here. And you can pretty much use this all around the globe no matter where you're at. You don't even need to speak 
the language in the country or, or to help the smith that you're forging with. Generally, this is an accepted principle at the anvil. No, thank you, Thomas. A hole is you still give one more hit. Yep. So, like, if I tell, say, if we're forging on this piece here, are we still at the anvil, Jess? Yes. Okay. Say, if we're forging on this piece, all right, and he's hammering, right, and I'm like, whoa, he's gonna give it. Like, if he's up at that point, if he's up about yeah. to take another strike, and I say, whoa, he's going to finish out that blow. And that's your job as a director to indicate that, to, uh, to keep that in mind, to stop one blow short of where you would like it to be. Because remember, you still have a hand hammer that you can then, whoa, then you can start getting back in here and dress up whatever you need to do uh, after you yell out, whoa. Generally speaking, it's best to use, um, you know, a rest command. So if I hit once, that means all I want him to do is hit once because my hammer is over here. When we're working back and forth, that means stop, see? I set my hammer down like this, that means cut out the action. Now that may look fairly fast in the action. We might be going to town and then I might go like this and skip it over here and then pick up the hammer and do something else. But that's up to him to keep an eye on, right? To do it like that. So. And he's also directing me where to hit, where he hits. Yep. This is kind of an extension of his finger. Oh, yeah. Telling me where he wants me to hit. You're not there as a director to give a full blow. You're just there to go, I want it there, I want it there, I want it there, I want it there, wherever, right? That's that's your job as a director. It's up to the guy with the hammer, sledgehammer, to do the heavy lifting of the job. You go back to main cam. All right. So yes, yes and no. There's not a secret, it's not necessarily a secret language or anything like that. It is a, it's just by getting to know somebody and working with them. And the longer you've worked with somebody, the less you actually have to say. Uh, Thomas and I, we got to work a few times last winter yeah. together, striking and, and doing some stuff, right? Or, or early spring, right? We got to work together in early spring. And so that's how much time we've actually had striking Smith striker combo at something. The more we work together, the better that'll be where I won't even say, I, I still have to give some commands right now, but verbal, but the more we work together, there won't be no need for talking whatsoever, uh, just because the hammers will do the talking. <coughs> if, you're, if you're trying to get started into that yourself, maybe you've got a buddy you wanna work with or, or something like that to have over or wife or whatever to have help you out in the forge, it's important that you communicate what it is that you're trying to accomplish first. Uh, remember, they can't read minds, right? Your helper can't read your mind. So communicate, say, okay, hey, when we take this next heat, I'm gonna come out to the anvil. We're gonna put it on here. I'm gonna hold this like so, right? I'm gonna have you hit on top, right? Give me three blows, then stop, right? whatever, you communicate that ahead of the heat. And that way when it's go time, you're both on the same page and you can end up making some great ironwork together until you get that rhythm together. This currently 551? 551? Yes. Wow. <laughs> it's went quick. It has. Way, way too quick. Yeah. <laughs> way, way, way too quick. Okay. 551, we should give something away. Mm -hmm. It's been far too long, huh? How many people we got joining us? We have 137. Woo! All right, we're gonna give several somethings away. How's that sound? Sounds good. Uh, just to save us time. <laughs> just, just to get after it, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Ah. So let me set these off the side. We got several cool things to give away. All right.
boom. I've got three separate items I'm gonna give away. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right, are we camera number two? Uh-huh. Okay. All right, so the first item up for grabs that we're gonna give away is one of these, uh, you know, easiest spatula and ladle blanks uh, sets. I'm gonna give one of these, uh, a pair of this away to one lucky viewer here. Uh, all you gotta do is comment in the comment section that you want one of those. The next item up for grabs we're gonna give away is this Kiridashi made by Wiley Rook Blade Works. And funny story about this, I actually forgot I had this. This was laying under some other paperwork, <laughs> comically enough, it got shuffled under something. And this was supposed to be given away months and months and months ago. And so there's a little bit of patina on that handle now that wasn't there previously, uh, but it's still razor sharp. So we'll be giving away that Kiridashi. And then we will also be giving away these tongs that we purchased uh, over at Ken's Custom Iron. And these are your bolt jaw tongs, uh, you know, bolt jaw tong blanks. So we're gonna be giving a set of those away uh, as well. So we're gonna start with the spatula and ladle set. Uh, all of these prizes, except for the anvil, uh, or the swedge block is open worldwide. So the swedge block itself, unfortunately, is only in the United States and whatever, Puerto Rico or uh, yes, something US like and that. Puerto Rico. And that's, pure, and that's per, per the manufacturer, buying it from Holland Anvil and then they're shipping it straight to you. So uh, just keep that in mind. So, all right, are we ready? We are, are people commenting they for are those commenting. of you who are just joining us for your first time here. I'll go ahead and give you the rundown the way this works. There's nothing you got to do for this. You don't have to go pee in a cup. I don't need to know your mother's maiden name. I don't need to do anything like that. You just have to be 18 years of age or older or have a parent or legal guardian contact us for you after the stream is over for, to verify that you won. And you have to make a comment in the comment section. And when I stop doing that, that's when we draw one name at random. Pretty simple, huh? Mm -hmm. Right? So, all right. We're going to go for the spatula and ladle set. Right. Also, if you don't win these, you can find these over at our website, uh, blacksmithingblanks.com. Mm -hmm. So be sure to check that out. Jessica's got the links, all the necessary links and uh, right. contact emails and everything linked up in the description. So be sure to check that out. Yep. Ready? Ready. Set? Go. Who do we got? K. Derek Goodwin with Spatula. Derek Goodwin. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. Derek Goodwin, congratulations. You're the winner of the Spatula and Ladle Blank. Uh, hope you enjoy them there. And uh, we'll get those shipped out to you prompt, pronto if you <laughs> get with us with your contact information at the contact link down in the description. Contact email, huh? Yes. All right, we want to give away the Kiridashi? Yes, we do. We're going to do some rapid fire giving away, huh? Yeah, we are. All right. All right, so now we're going to give away the Kiridashi from Wile Wiley Rook Blade Works. Are we on the main cam or the side? Side cam. Okay, good. Campbell cam. All right. So for this one, all you got to do is comment Kiridashi. And if you don't know how to spell that, just go with K <laughs> or something that has dashi in it. Ready? Mm -hmm. Set? Are we good? Yes, we're ready, guys. Let's go. <laughs> Who do we got? Ari, uh, Ari Milky. Ari Milky, With congratulations. Kiridashi. You are the winner of this Kiridashi. Get with us through the contact email in the description. We'll get that shipped out to you pronto. I should also mention that everything we give away is completely free of charge. There is no charge whatsoever. We ship it to you completely um, at our cost. So there's no gimmicks, no nothing like that. So now we're going to go ahead and give away the tong blanks. All right. Are we ready? Yes, we are. Are they commenting? They are commenting. And for this one, just comment tong me or something or tongs, huh? Yep. Are we at the main cam or the... Secondary. Down there. Secondary, where uh -huh. we at the main cam? For a moment, yeah. Yeah, for a moment. They yeah. were looking at the side of my head. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready, set, go.
Who do we got? We have Titus Blacksmith Forge with Tong Tong Song. Tong 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 Tong. Titus, congratulations. Yep. <laughs> you won this uh, set of uh, Tong Blanks from Ken's Custom Iron there. So, uh, yep, Bolt Jaw Tong Blanks. Get with us. You've heard the spew. Contact, email, description. Do it. Do it now. <laughs> Wiley, good, you made it. Wiley's huh? here. Oh, Wiley is here. Wiley's here? Yep. Okay, hey, Wiley, we just gave away a Kiridashi we forgot that we had of yours. From last year? <laughs> <laughs> just, just for fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we'll throw in a piece of high carbon steel. Hopefully I won't forget that it's sitting there. And, oh, yeah. You know, we'll let that get hot, and uh, we're going to start forming our bit before we start closing up. Uh, this axe billet, if you will. Questions, Jess? Comments? Um, ooh, Anything. Let's see, there's a super chat. Hey, hey, let's super see. chats. Jordan Hartman sent $5, says, does it help if we message a bunch of times or is once enough for the giveaways? And great show today. Uh, you can go as many times as you like. Uh, just once the, once the actual giveaway is over, stop commenting. Otherwise, it just gets annoying to have a bunch of spam comments. But while, the, while we're drawing for the giveaway, comment as many times as you want. Each time counts as an entry. Possible chance that we pick your name. But it's not necessary. You can probably, a lot of people just make one comment. In fact, some people have had side conversations, weren't even they trying were. to win and end up winning. So, yep. you know, uh, it is totally at random. Jessica just scrolls and picks a name at random. Wherever her mouse cursor or finger lands on. We found that, that to be the really the most fair way of doing stuff. It's it's fairly easy to do. There's not some computer generated thing. I don't really trust that uh, to just random number generators. Uh, they just seem kind of faceless. I feel like it's a lot nicer to kind of actually land on somebody's name with your own finger and say, oh, okay, hey, that guy won. So not leave it up to some algorithm to pick. Mike G, we're doing good. Hello, hello. That's been a little while. Uh, Aimless Adventures sent a Smiley Poo sticker. A Smiley Poo. That one was for Thomas. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. I feel enough of that at work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's Smiley there, though. It wasn't really Smiley. No, <laughs> Oh, that was kid. that was good. It took him a whole like <laughs> it took him a whole like ten seconds to pick up what I was putting down. I'm like that one's for Thomas. <laughs> oh, if you all don't know, Thomas works in the septic industry, right? Is that yes. a is that a proper yep, yep. assessment? I uh, I install drain fields and set tanks in. They can't see your face. Just yeah. talk with talk your hands. With the hands. Yeah. <laughs> He does things no, with other things around other people who have things that fall out their bottoms. That's a dirty job that somebody has to do. So one thing that connects us to the rich people as well. Yes, it does. <laughs> Oh, I've got so many comments, so, so, so many jokes to go around that. Can they even hear Thomas uh, decently? Can anybody hear me, actually? He's going to have to stand close to one of our mics in order uh, to pick up. So we got to get, like, kissing cousin close or what? <laughs> yeah. What kind of stinks a little? <laughs> I always stink. Shoulder to shoulder, at least, I guess. Yeah. Let, let's just... Hi. <laughs> <laughs> that is too much man in one stream. Far Run Forge says Thomas looks like he needs an adult. <laughs> <laughs> I have a beard. I'm a man. <laughs> Honest. <laughs> Nate Vol says he works at a sewage treatment plant and he understands. Yeah.
Let's see, Christopher Fay says, any advice on how to use a 25 millimeter hardy hole as a 12 mil millimeter hardy hole, uh, how to convert it or something? So they have, I think the uh, Chio has a 12 millimeter. That's why he was So asking. how to make a what? So how to adapt a hardy hole, uh, hardy. To make it bigger? Mm -hmm. You can adapt them down smaller, but you can't adapt. You can't, you can't make the hardy hole bigger without physically grinding or removing material out of the hardy hole. Um, to take the hardy tool itself, you can always grind it down to fit that hardy dimension. Uh, that's really your only options. Cut away material, grind it down until it fits snug uh, in, into the hardy hole. Uh, another thing you can do is forge it down. You can actually forge it down if you want to reharden and heat treat the tool. If it's made out of mild steel and it's a hardy tool, it doesn't matter. So that part's kind of up to you uh, when it comes to that. Uh, Adurd, let me address your um, concern there. He had been posing several blacksmithing questions back to back, kind of in a rapid succession. I did okay. see your questions and um, you know, I like your enthusiasm and you asked good questions. I would just say space them out a little further. He got blocked by one of the moderators for asking the questions too rapidly, but they, they were relevant, so. They were relevant questions, mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, yeah, so if, if, if you comment, if there's like one person's comment and there's like 52 of your comments, that's seen as spam. And that's pretty universal around uh, YouTube uh, because there's bots that do that. They make the same question. Hey, look at me, pick me, talk to me, do this, do that, right? How's this? How did your face get so big? Blah, 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 whatever, right? And it just, it eats up, it eats up your feed where nobody else gets a question. So space them out a little bit. Um, we do our best to try to answer as many people as we can and still stay on topic and, and uh, forge and do, all, do it all at once here. So but, uh, what was some of his questions? So maybe I can um, answer. They, a couple. they had to do with uh, some, some of the tooling you're using a little bit and different uses for this wedge block. So he would have to ask him again. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead and ask him again. Just everybody remember that there's plenty of time. Roy talks a lot. <laughs> if I don't answer him in this stream, that's why I do streams every other Friday. Right? <laughs> And also, oh. there's a lot of other great um, blacksmiths also in this channel, so they may be able. There's also a lot of other great blacksmiths <laughs> watching in this channel right now. So if Jess isn't able to catch it right away, then maybe one of the other guys, please feel free to help him out and answer those. Because, yep. you know what, I'm in that same boat when I'm at home watching Roy. I may have a question and or watching somebody else. Um, else is live, they may not get it right away, but mm -hmm. somebody else has answered my question. So yep. it, it really may helps not out. be directly from Roy, but you know, it's a lot of other great guys out there watching this channel as we speak. Yep, yep. All right, let's do some hammer work here. All right. I'm gonna dress this first. Working on a tiny little piece here. There we go. We're just trying to resize this bit, this little piece of 1045. Glenn at GS Tonks 
says, hi, Roy. Maybe one day we can do a long distance collaboration. And thanks for your generosity the other day. I will return the favor. Really enjoy your content and positivity. Very welcome, Glenn. Thank you so much for being here. Everybody say hi to Glenn at GS Tongs. He's got a great channel uh, over on YouTube. Go check him out. Uh, YouTube unfortunately removed the feature where you could literally tap on someone's name, hit go to channel, and it would put the stream down in a mini player, and then you would be able to like go over and sub to somebody. So you actually do have to click out of the stream to go subscribe or, or go check them out. But Glenn's got a great channel, and uh, I would love to do that. Love to do a collaboration. That would be fun. It'd be, I guess it would technically qualify as an international collaboration, wouldn't it? <laughs> which would be totally cool. Wouldn't mind doing that at all. Question from Eddard. He says, what product do you find sharpens your techniques? What product? Yes, so like what type of product do you make or what type of item do you forge that hones in on your techniques? Hmm. Well, I don't make products anymore, so that's a little bit, that's a little bit different. Um, I would say every new job that I take on is generally a challenge. Um, for the most part, when I get commissioned to do a job, it's something I've never done before. So the work in of itself sharpens my techniques and it pushes me to be creative, right? So that, that would be, I guess, my answer to that. I don't have a particular thing that I do to sharpen my techniques. As far as things that I like to do or that I would want to get better at is engraving, chasing work, um, repousse work or repousse work. Um, yeah, that kind of work. That's something I'd like to focus more into uh, and just get better at. Just continue to do more of that type of work just because I feel like that is at the top end of what you can do as a blacksmith. Um, as far as forge welding, um, all your fundamentals, forge welding, tapering, punching, drifting, uh, all the fundamentals of joinery, things like that. I wouldn't say that I'm perfect at every one of those, but they're all in the bag, so to speak. I can employ them at a moment's notice on a project if I were to be needed to. So, <coughs> um, so those get sharpened the more you do them. Um, but it varies based upon the job. So there's not one job anymore uh, that I would say actually hones my, hones my skills right now, currently. That is subject to change. <laughs> Thank you, Glenn, for the 300 NT Super Chat. He says, thanks again. Thank you, Glenn. Have no clue what 300 NT is, but it's greatly appreciated, <laughs> brother. I, I didn't know either. So like, <laughs> that's an NT by it. It doesn't really matter. It's the sentiment that counts. So let's go to the anvil. All right. Thank you so much for returning the kindness. I'm good, Thomas. I'll have it. I'll have it. I'm oh. good. Just need to straighten up things. Yep. Take out the wonky donkey. Yeah, just the winky wonky donkey. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just got that book for my son. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering yeah. if you would know. Yeah. yeah. I just got that book for my boy. So. I picked up on the reference right away, huh? They have a video on YouTube with the song too. Oh, yeah. You probably love that. <laughs> Was it the stinky winky dinky donkey, <laughs> whatever, stinky yeah. dinky winky dinky donkey, or whatever? Something like that. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> what are they teaching our kids these days? <laughs> NT stands for New Taiwan. New Taiwan. New Taiwan. Cool. <laughs> Never heard of that type of currency, so that's cool. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. 
Jim Berkeley sent a $5 super chat and says, Roy, what state is your forge in? It's in a state. <laughs> it's sightly. I don't know. <laughs> I think somebody asked earlier, I wasn't sure if it was Jim or not, but where your forge hood went from the old. Where my forge hood went? Mm -hmm. um, so, great question. It basically rusted away, so I got rid of it. Uh, I wasn't using it in here. That was a holdover from my previous, my previous shop. Oh, we can go back to camp, main camp. Yes. That was a holdover. That was a holdover from my previous shop where I had where I had my forge all the way butted up against the wall. So I had a place for that forge hood to be, and then I ran my uh, vent pipe up and out. With where I'm at now, I'm I'm going to inhibit to. I'm going to adhere to more of an open format concept with my forge. Now, I've also switched from burning coal, green coal, to just burning coke in my forge. So I don't need the hood for the coke because there's no smoke. There's no smoke to go out. Now, there is a lot of soot, like uh, just fly ash or whatever you want to call it, you know, just from uh, forge ash, I guess. And that's not as nice. That's not, not as much fun to have that kind of blowing up everywhere and things get coated. So eventually the big plan is I will have a stone hearth. I'm thinking that this forge is where I want it. So I will have a stone hearth and then I will have a large uh, hood above it. And um, that hood will be powered. So it'll be a powered exhaust hood to pull out anything and blow it out the, the top. So it'll be able to do both. It'll either be powered or it'll just be able to have natural drafting. Um, now generally when you go with a really open concept uh, like this in order not to get a whole bunch of smoke rolling out, um, even if it does draft well or have a, a bit of breeze come through and blow the smoke right in your face, you gotta have a powered draft right above it that you know, can overcome that stiff wind, if you will. So. Uh, question on that, Roy. Oh. Since heat rises, could you put a, a fan in there so as soon as the heat's going up, it can actually start turning the fan? And you can't, it's a, you can't yeah, like one of those little spinning yeah. ones that you yeah, put on top of a barn. In, in your stack? Um, you could put it on top as long as it was far enough away from the main heat source, you know. I was just thinking, you know, a mechanical versus electronic. Yeah. All right, go back to the anvil, Jess. All right. Uh, let's see here. Let's see how well Thomas can strike lightly. Well. The weirdest part about shaping down little odds and end pieces like this is the fact that there's not a lot of space for you to both grip onto the piece and shape the wedge that you need because you kind of your tongs are kind of in the way. We'll heat that up a bit more. Jay Meska, thank you for the five euro super chat. It says from Lithuania, subscriber from 2016. Hey, thank you so much. Five years. Five years, man. We've got some veterans, huh? Mm -hmm. We got some veterans in the house this evening. They've put up with my nonsense for five years. W you e deserve the hand clap. <laughs> W. E. Beasley says, have you ever used a propane forge? Uh, yep. Got one right over there. So, use it all the time. <laughs> 3 a.m. Forge says, how tall is the roof in there, and do you have vents to deal with the heat near the roof line? 
We actually, I actually posted a picture, if you follow us on Instagram, uh, of Roy working on the hole uh, that was at, up near the roof. Wrong end. Just yesterday. Go ahead. Up higher, closer to the tongue. Thirty-two foot, though, is the answer to the peak of the roof. Over here. <laughs> well. Yes, Curtis. Roy was definitely scared of the camera back then. <laughs> That's why our first ten videos were slideshows. They're talking bad about me, Thomas. <laughs> They're talking bad about me. They still love it, though. At least that's what they say. Aimless <laughs> Adventure says, I remember when Roy was in a shipping container with a grainy camera. He's <laughs> 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 remembering this a little differently than I do. <laughs> I guess it kind of looked like a shipping container. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't a shipping container. <laughs> It was a steel box, though, practically, of a shop. Oh. Corey Shire's been watching the channel be for good. six years, too. On the next one. <laughs> Woo. Chris Schaefer, thank you for the $20 super chat. He thank says, you, Chris. Towards a Samsung Vibe smart board for Roy to draw on or for Roy forging in a kilt. <laughs> <laughs> a Samsung Vibe. Vibe. Smart board. I don't Smart board. I have no that. clue what that is. No clue. Oh, it's good to be back <laughs> to streaming. Ouroboros Armory says, hey all, just got in from my forge. How are things going? Hello, Ouroboros. It's going well. Going well, I think. That's kind of up for everybody else to judge. Mm -hmm. Huh. Think here. We've got like half a dozen tongs here. This is such a weird piece to hold. <laughs> Coffee Studio says, I just had flashbacks of sticking for Roy and getting a twofer. <laughs> the, the stick it, the stick it to cricket. <laughs> oh yeah, he's having flashbacks to getting hit. That's right. Go to the anvil. All right. Got to get creative. So, on this bit, you might notice that this bit is a bit wider than what my actual wrought iron is. And there's a reason for that, and it's a it's kind of a it's kind of a multi multi-purpose reason. The reason why the bit is slightly wider then the wrought iron, or I should say the first reason, and maybe the primary reason, is because the wrought iron is going to spread much more rapidly than the high carbon tool steel counterpart. Okay? It's going to spread a lot more rapidly than what wrought iron is going to do, so it's going to catch up real quick. And if the bit isn't slightly larger than what the rod is, when you start spreading things out, the rod ends up fish mouthing, fish lipping over where the steel bit is and creating a seam. The other reason why the bit is a bit bigger and wider than what the actual rod is, is because there's a chance by trying to bring the rod iron up to the temperature in which that this can be welded into it, there's a good chance that that wrought iron, uh, to bring it up to that temp, we're going to burn up a little bit of this bit. We're going to burn this steel somewhat on the corners and things like that. So we need something to trim off in the final product. Um, there's two schools of thought on that. You can completely encase the bit with the wrought iron to protect it from burning. Or you can add extra steel, high carbon steel, so that way if you burn a little off, 
you can always trim it, uh, trim it down to size and back to good steel. So you're kind of splitting the difference as it were. Aimless Adventure sent $10 for a Roy rant. Woohoo! $10 for a Roy rant. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> There's so many, so many I could get into. Are we back at the main cam? Yes. Okay. Good. I'll have to think on it. I'll have to think on it. We're going to cut barbs into this next. Man, people paying me to rant, huh? <laughs> people paying me to rant. I got one. I've got a good one. We ready, hon? We ready? Yeah. Okay. So, I know that this isn't a popular thing to do nowadays, but I would like everybody to take and consider this because one man's troll is another person's treasure or subscriber, <laughs> right? And so as where you might be my best of friend online because you like old Roy here, you like what I do, maybe you like something about the channel, maybe you just like Jessica and you hate this guy, I don't care. <laughs> Chances are you are probably a troll in somebody else's comment section because we like what we like as human beings and we dislike what we dislike as human beings as well, right? And we feel the much needed need to express those feelings to that creator that we've never met, never had a conversation with, never actually shook hands or, you know, took any time to know anything about them. So, and we're all guilty of it. We're all guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. Well, I don't know if Jessica's guilty of it. She's too busy to get online <laughs> and comment. <laughs> I rarely <laughs> But, you know, I really browse you know, the <laughs> there, there's been there's been many a people out there. Again, you could probably say you're guilty of it at some point. Maybe it was on somebody that you thought wasn't paying attention to you enough or whatever. But it would be so my my gripe, if you will, or my my rant, if you would be, is if you're going to rant in the comment section, of someone's video and you're going to make a big deal about something some sort of fault that you see in that person it would be wise that you actually listen with both your ears that God gave you and that little gray dangly bit that's in between your ears that's called a brain and actually listen to the words that were coming out of the person's mouth and don't read between the lines too much actually listen to them for what they are trying to express because this whole thing on YouTube with video work is it's an imperfect very terrible communication type device it really is to, to communicate to you all the avenues there it all the thoughts all the possible theories to have a great debate about something is quite impossible because right now I literally have Thomas right here staring at me like, yes, him, right? <laughs> Down, like just having a seat over here. I have my wife Jessica in here looking at me. And I have you, the Lumex G7 in a small rig camera cage <laughs> looking at me. And my only replies or rebuttals or my responses or the only thing that I get is from when Jessica says, hey, I have a question or hey, this person's being a booger or hey, well, whatever, right? Like that's the only interaction. And so social media is not a great place to have social discourse around a subject um, that can get dicey or an argument because sarcasm doesn't read well. Doesn't matter how many LOLs or winky faces you put beyond, this, uh, beyond the thing that you say, it doesn't always come across like you mean or you intend. So here recently, I've had multiples of people who have decided to make it their mission to say mean things. <laughs> and, and, and 
just, I, I, don't, I don't know. It just, it, it's, it's one of those things that it, it never gets old because they throw shade on you, like as if you are a horrible person. And then for a guy like me, I actually have to sit there and I have to analyze that. Am I being these things that this person who I've never met, I don't know their real name, I've never seen a picture of them, am I actually being this person, right? Is there something that I'm giving off, some sort of arrogance, some sort of whatever, am I putting out there, out there in the world, into the universe, that I'm not picking up on, right? Because I like to be Christ-like. I, I, I try to be as close as I can. Am I good at it? No. Oh, no. No, no, no. I am not. I'm not great at it. But I try to be. And so, therefore, I analyze those things. If, one, if somebody said, hey, you're not being very Christian-like, I have to stop and assess. I'm like, okay, well, what's Christian-like mean? I have to assess. I have to assess those things. It's just the way that I work. And so... Yeah, if you're going to have an argument, if you're going to start a debate that doesn't need to be started, and it's going to especially be in one of my comment sections, and you don't want to get your butt blocked, you best listen to the whole video first. Don't cherry pick at the beginning, 12 seconds at the beginning, watched three seconds in the middle, and then wrote your comment in the last eight seconds of the video and then start some sort of debate. It's a great way of finding yourself on the outside looking in and me never really caring because it, it, this is gonna, okay, arrogance alert, arrogance alert. We need Foley effects. We need Foley effects. Right, arrogance alert. There is 77,000 of you out there. There's one of me. If one of you like, oh, 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 Roy said something, and it, oh, 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 I can't believe it. He's such a terrible person. I'll show him. I'll just unsubscribe. I hope you feel vindicated, but I will never know. I will never know. It didn't really have that much impact. It, it didn't. I care. I care. I care that people be around. I care that people subscribe. I care that people get good information, good blacksmithing information, things like that. But I'm not online to have long drawn out arguments or debates for anyone. Don't really care to. There's too many good people out there learning good things from what I'm doing to, yeah, cater to everybody who's gotten offended over some off word that I had said. It's, it's crazy. Can't do it. Don't care. I care, but I don't care. It's not possible for me to care. I won't know. You can say, hey, I'm unsubscribing because you're a jerk. <laughs> and, your, and your message is going to get drowned out by those 4,000 comments a month that we get on the channel. I do my best to reply to people. I do my best to be as genuine as I can to people, right? And, and as nice as I can to people and, and to answer questions when I can or make a video on, on it, you know, and I, I try to stay up to date with the community. It's difficult. It's difficult. I say that I do a pretty decent job for giving my <laughs> uh, time for such a thing. So there's a rant. You paid for it. You got it. <laughs> So if you're going to, to sum it all up, to sum this up. <laughs> Brittingham Ford says it perfectly. He says, people suck, then we die. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Oh, again, to sum, it up, to sum it all up, again, if you're going to leave, be a troll in somebody's comment section, at least hear them out all the way through on their video. If it's a 12 minute video and you want to post your hate and your anger and your rage, at least listen to the whole video <laughs> first. That way you have good talking points and you can back your stuff up with actual factual. Here, you said this and this is incorrect. What's up, hon? I was laughing at Troy. Troy, he said, I'm not going to unsubscribe, Roy. The jerk thing doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> <laughs> 
dr the drifting doesn't bother him jerk at all. Thing. So. The jerk thing. The what? Jerk. Oh, the jerk thing. Uh -huh. It doesn't bother him at all. Well, I'm glad. So, all right. David Walker also chipped in $5. I think that was towards the Roy Ranch, who's undesignated. <laughs> Thank you. Oh. And also Thomas sent a $5 super chat to <laughs> highlight um, another comment. <laughs> to tell me <laughs> to I, shut up? Is that what you sent it for? <laughs> not specifically. <laughs> well, thank you all who super chatted, including Thomas. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it. I've got another one here for you all real quick this evening. Oh. I'm going to get myself in hot water with wait, this wait, wait. one, but I don't care. Before you so, go. We're, we're going to do this first. We're going to go to the anvil. Okay. Okay? Go ahead. All right. So now I'm going to use a chisel, and we're going to chisel in some teeth here. Hold up. I'm going to split this one once. Mm, too, too hard. Lighten up. Good. Yeah, that's good. Give me a tap tap. Yep, give me a tap back that way. Square it up. Whoa. Good. So what I've established here is I've actually, if you notice, it's wider in this direction now than that taper. That's going to provide biting places for the rot to bite on, for the steel to bite into the wrought iron and won't allow this, well, hopefully won't allow this uh, bit to slip back out when we start welding it. This is a pretty common historical technique to use. All right, that bit's ready to go. The rot's good to go. This might be my last rant for the evening. How's that sound? Okay. Can you can I squeeze a question in real quick? Yeah, squeeze a question in. Let's right. hear it. Sprinkle Donut Forge has some big steel, um, uh, big truck brake S cam rollers. He wants to know if you know what they're made for. He has a lot of them brand new, and he's trying to figure out what to use them for. He says they're not cast. S cam rollers. Mm -hmm. Big okay. truck. Brake. I'm 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 not familiar. Thomas though. <laughs> We're calling in a variance. Okay, so I don't know what the material is made out of, but where it's located. So you have your brakes that actually sit on, sorry about that, and your S-cam rotates on that, and that's what the, the S-cam pushes against. I know mm -hmm. it is hard steel, but I don't know what it's, I know it's not cast mm -hmm. as well like Sprinkle Donuts just said. My guess is it's probably gonna be high carbon, like probably, 5160 kind of like springs are made out of my guess because they do take a lot of wear they, and uh, they very rarely rust or at least the ones I've taken out of some semis from doing air brakes they actually punch out very easy so they don't really rust so there's some anti-rusting may it's got high in chromium in it or something probably high chromium but I don't know what they are I have some at home if you want to play with some no thanks <laughs> 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 I'm not into working hard. I don't know if you all have noticed that or not. So. They are tough. They are very yeah. tough. Oh. All right, any more questions? Uh, let's see. Keith Miller sent a super sticker of a kitty cat. Thank you, Heath. And he also said, hey, Roy, I subscribe to you because you are a genuine person. Well, thank you, Heath. Thank you. I'm glad you think so. Was that, was that sarcasm? <laughs> <laughs> it had a dot, dot, dot in there. <laughs> oh. All right, you may continue on your Roy rant. All right, I may continue one. on my Roy rant. So, so, I think we've all been slaves to political correctness from time to time. And, well, I'm sure I've annoyed somebody with just saying the word slave. Um, <laughs> I might even be blocked on YouTube. Who knows? Tomorrow's a new day. We'll find out, okay? But a, a thing that kind of bugs me quite a bit, and 
I, and I see it all the time. I, I see it all over social media. I see it all over stuff. Is people making apologies for the way that they talk, uh, their jargon, their regional. Um, I, I, what, what do you call that? Their dialect. The, 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 the thing is it a dialect? It's not really a dialect. Mm, mannerisms. Their mannerisms, right? So I get critiqued all the time on my mannerisms because I get it. I'm kind of a public figure, right? Like I'm on YouTube, and and, and so. I'm out there and put myself out there. People can, well, they can say, frankly, whatever they like, right? It's, a, it's an open internet forum, so to speak. And, but the thing that really, really grinds on me is to see as many people as I see backpedal on and apologize profusely because they've used a mannerism and somebody says, that's incorrect or you've offended me because you use such mannerisms. Get over it. Just get over it, right? Don't apologize for the mannerisms that you're using that make you up, make up who you are, uh, so to speak. You would be shocked, <laughs> frankly shocked, if you ever worked in any trade or industry ever that required hard knuckle busting work. The mannerisms that get thrown around. Trust me, it's not PC at all, anywhere. I, I, I invite you to go find some men, maybe women, who knows, a construction site, and just roll down your car window on a bright sunny day or a rainy day when, when you know, a plumber's standing in knee deep you. And go ahead and correct them politically correct them about the language they're using and see how that works for you. So online, I get tired of seeing people cowtail to things like that. For instance, I say you guys, like the Goonies, you guys. It's like people. I don't know where I picked it up from. It's just, just an in general statement. It's like you all or y'all, right? From people, it's just general, right? It's meant people. You peoples over there, right? And I'll have people who correct me and saying, there's women who watch too. No, duh, Dick Tracy. I know there's women that watch the channel. There's 9.8% of you viewers that are women out there. There's no, there's no, uh, uh, there's no offense implied there, right? I'm not like directly thinking like, you know what's really going to chap them? You know what's really going to get them? You know what's going to get those women angry? By me saying you guys all the time. Because you know what? 90% of the time, it's not the women that comment and try to put you in your political correct bubble. It's some dude with Cheetos on his white wife beater shirt. Can't even say that anymore, right? Like they used to be called wife beaters. <laughs> A certain generation, the people in the 90s and beyond, will remember that as... Wife beaters, right? Yeah, the, 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 I don't even know what you call them now. Tank tops? Yeah. They're not tank tops. Are they tank tops? Is that the correct terminology for guys? I know that they call them for yeah. women tank tops, but mm -hmm. yeah. So again, I probably upset somebody's app cart. He said wife beater. I know, I did. You're welcome. I'm a 90s kid. <laughs> I, did not, I did not grow up a sissy. Well, there you go. Sissy, that's a der that one, that's that I can't use that one, right? That's a derogative thing. Um, if if you have to spend if you have to spend in a, an a amazing amount of energy, just like this conversation, I don't know how long this rant's went on for so far. If you've had to expend so much energy to make sure that you say everything as eloquent and as beautiful as humanly possible. You're wasting time. You're wasting time getting to the point, the point that we're after, blacksmithing, forging, right? Like, oh, you're going to make this weld here. I don't need to, you know, you need to make this weld here, you guys. Somebody's like, ah, 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 there's women who, how is that pertinent to what we're doing, right? Don't back off on that. If you said you guys, you said you all, you said whatever, who cares? I love all the women that watch the channel in a strictly platonic way, 
See, I got it. See, I have to make that right. I got to make that association, right? Platonic. That's the right word, right? Yeah. Okay. Just making sure, right? You know, that, she's the only one I'll cow tell to. Otherwise, deal with it. I say, you guys, you all, youans, youngins, don't care. <laughs> just the way I talk. Baldwin Ford says construction sites are his safe place in SoCal. <laughs> I mean, I see, I see all sorts of social media creators do it. They catch themselves and then they put in like an asterisk. Oh, and I mean women too. It had nothing, to, there was no extra value you provided by correcting yourself for the way that you talk. Yeah. And just creators shouldn't have to do that. Just people shouldn't have to do that. You would be that weird. I would love to see some of these people who correct people do that in person. Oh, gosh. <laughs> to just literally do that in person. You'd get laughed out. You'd be a laughing stock of the neighborhood. You'd be like, whatever. Stay away from weird Bob. Right? <laughs> like, nobody would invite you over to their campfire or, you know have a social drink with them or anything else. They'd be like, oh no, don't invite. Don't invite Dave from accounting. He's always correcting us on the correct way to speak. You should have heard us today at my job site. <laughs> yeah. Now, I, after breaking that tank, yeah. you should have really heard the, the job site. I've been on enough <laughs> job sites, I don't even need to hear it to know what went out, you know, out there into the ethosphere. Oh, <laughs> questions, comments, uh, complaints. Uh, <laughs> Jessica's overwhelmed over there. She's like, you God. stirred up the hornet's nest, Roy. I don't know where to go with this. Black, <laughs> Blacksmith's Matter says, I think I might get in trouble for my YouTube name. I'm not black and my name isn't Smith. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you forget, you probably don't matter. So <laughs> All three together, so. Uh, Sprinkle Donut Forge says, I'm like this. If you can't take me at my worst, you don't deserve my best, but I'm an angel. <laughs> what? what? Why, why, why do I picture him in like curling irons <laughs> and like a pink, you know, like, like a really nice pink snuggly uh, robe and like big bunny eared <laughs> things when he says that. <laughs> if you can't take me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. <laughs> Keith Miller says, Roy, not just a blacksmith, but a wordsmith as well. Oh, yeah. I'm terrible at words. That's the thing. That's the thing, you guys. Um, I am not some grammar guru, right? I, I'm not. <laughs> I did. I, I totally hosed up English and social studies, and I was terrible. I was like, just what's the grade above F? D? Yeah. Yeah, I was like D, he average. Can't read either. He doesn't yeah. know the <laughs> Shut up, Thomas. Shut up, Thomas. Oh. But yeah, you know, I mean, I was a terrible student when it came to that. So those were not my forte, right? So <laughs> most of my grammar came from construction sites, which is bad. That's a bad where place to go get your grammar. And from people who didn't have very great grammar either. So Don't be grammar police. Nobody wants you as your as their friend when you're being grammar police. Ideal idea. That was one that I had to get corrected on. Oh yeah. Was it on your channel or somebody else about calling somebody a grammar Nazi? It's yeah. mine. Yeah, yeah, it's mine. It's yeah. my channel. <laughs> yeah. so Who else? Who else's rant channel? Rant so. To say something about the Nazis and it's like, I don't know. It's just a phrase, my man. Yeah. Um, on a different topic. <laughs> Just to change of topics. <laughs> Blob that Mania. means it's bad. <laughs> Blob Mania says, Roy, have you ever heard of mouse hole anvils? They no longer exist. They do exist. <laughs> you just can't buy them brand new anymore. And yes, I have. Good it question. Aerie says, will you weld the carbon steel and the wrought iron all in one or weld the wrought first 
uh, then open it up and weld the carbon in after? Uh, it will be all at once. So uh, reason, reason for that being is how short, how short the distance is there with the eye. I'm actually using the high carbon steel since it's going all the way through to the, um, to the haft since it's going all the way through to the eye of the axe itself, I'm actually using that as my spacer for the front end um, of the axe, of the axe eye, right? So it's gonna go all the way up to the actual eye of the axe. So <coughs> it'll all be in one go. It'll be sandwiched in there and I'll bring the whole thing up to really white temperatures and then weld it in, hopefully. We shall see. But we do have to bend this around. I gotta put on some gloves because that's hot. Hot, hot, hot. Christopher Conkright says at what temperature do you do you apply your touch mark? At what temperature? Mm-hmm. Uh bright red. Bright red, sometimes orange, just depends on the material. Uh, it actually depends on your touch mark too. If you have something that um, basically relieves the background and all of your touch mark is positive in the foreground when you're done stamping it, so it presses the background down, you need it to be hotter. If you are pressing like say your initials, like with a, like a letter or a number stamp, then it can be cold because you're just, or, or it can be a lot colder because you're actually making a negative impression into the steel, just like a chisel or a center punch mark or something like that. Um, so that makes a lot more sense to do it that way. All right, we're gonna bend this close there, Thomas. You ready, Jess? Mm -hmm. Go to the anvil. And we'll see who else we can make angry today. <laughs> How's that sound? <laughs> All right, go ahead and close her up. Well, flip it there, hit there. Tap it. Well. Go ahead. Go ahead. Good. Switch tongs. I do not make axes on the regular. So if you see me struggling where you've seen your favorite creator somewhere else making these just like nobody's business, they've probably made hundreds of them. I have made, I have made hatchets and tomahawks before, not really axes. Hasn't been my forte, so. Bit of tap, high side. back in a little bit too far. I need to make it go out just a bit more and then I can make that weld. So. Tap that 
back down. That's a spicy meatball, by the way. You wouldn't say. You mean it sat on that forge that whole time and didn't get any cooler, Thomas? No, no. You mean it didn't get any cooler? But that's why you wear gloves. That's crazy. Crazy talk. Hold up. That's good. Good. That's where I want it. Roughly. There's probably some there's probably some axe maker out there right now <laughs> just cringing. Cringing hard. <laughs> Jeffrey Redinger says that that is some thick looking material. It is. It'll change. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, when you have a power, Thomas. It's all in the power, Thomas. We have the main cam? Main cam? Yes, we're on the really? main cam. Good. Cave T says, I did my first raft eye axe with a leaf spring bit. Getting this eye was a challenge by hand without a striker uh, and snow on the ground, L LOL. <laughs> a little slippery, eh? Mike G says, I used to make some small hatchets. They were okay, not always the prettiest. Yep. Oh. Well, axe making, axe making really is kind of an art form in itself. It really is. Um, I mean, you just got to get it true and right, and the eyes got to be correct, and everything, and it's fairly thin when everybody's done with it right. They don't have really thick eye walls like you have on a hammer. Uh, so there's less room for error. So you kind of got to really know what you're doing right around the eye and the right amount of hitting and what not to do stuff. So I might get this thing welded up. It might not weld the first time around. Who knows? This may not be the way to do it. I might need to draw the rot better first and make a bigger weld. My theory on it, make a smaller weld, then stretch everything out together. So, you know, you're, you're more sure to get a weld if you have less surface area that you're trying to weld up. You're going to have less inclusions or pockets, uh, so to speak, in that. That's, that's my theory on it. Again, I've made wrapped eye um, tomahawks or, and like hatchets, things like that before. Uh, and I always did it where I started small first and then build up bigger. From there. Jeff Woodring says, will you use some of the white magical powder or do it without? Um, I'm going to try to do it without. Mainly because unlike like a true bird's mouth weld, in like a bird's mouth weld, you have a crook at the bottom that can trap junk in it. And without the, without the white magical powder, the, the flux to go in there, it doesn't help drive that scale or that debris out um, of the welded joint. It's a lot easier to get an inclusion or something at the bottom of your weld. This, there's only just two surfaces. Now there's a broad surface there, so we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I'm not out much if it doesn't work, doesn't weld up. I'll change tactics and go again a different you know, go a different route. I was, I don't have the set tools and the things to do it properly. That's why I didn't attempt it this evening. This was kind of spur of the moment yesterday. I said, you know what? I want to try forging a little, you know, uh, Scandinavian camp axe there, just something to take with you into the woods uh, or a little belt axe. And I don't know if you'd say the proper way, but the one way that I was wanting to do it uh, was leaving a thicker pole, something that I could weld a bit to in the back, and basically doing a draw away method, so hollowing it out where the eye is going to be, and then weld up the um, weld up the blade and the bit. But we're doing it this way. We're trying it out. We'll see if I can't get away with this. Uh, eventually, I'm going to make a much larger axe. It'll be like a broad axe, and. So I'm still deciding how I want to do each individual step.
along the way. Like I said, there's somebody who probably does axes all the time who's cringing right now currently. You're quiet over there. Yes. <laughs> Why? I am looking for a good question for you. Oh, no questions? No comments? Uh -huh. I ran everybody off? How many people do we have? Uh, we currently have... We have 139, and it is 6.57 p.m. Okay. All right. I only scared away 30, <laughs> right, since last time. Uh, apparently, too much yak yak and not all black. Apparently, because people come to these things for that. I'm going to try to get this well before we give something away. Okay. Is that all right? So we still got two pairs of tongs to give away, and we have the Holland Anvil swedge block to give away. So for those of you who stuck around, You'll get the pleasure of seeing when we give those away. Christopher Fay says, what type of welding do you do or do you use? What type of welding? Uh-huh. Welding what? Like in general, just in the shop. Um, MIG, stick, forge. <laughs> that bit's not in there very secure. I'm going to I'm gonna have to bring it out and tap it together. Oh. It's sliding around, that bit sliding around. I don't like it. I don't like it, Thomas. I don't like it, very much. I don't like it sliding around. It's starting to fall out all over the place. Ah. Anyone pick that up with your <laughs> yeah. hands again, Tom? No, no, no. See, I'm, I'm Learned? 2% smart. <laughs> Two percent. Yeah. <laughs> All right, that should have it held now. So what I've been doing or attempting to do, I've been trying to push the bit past the hottest portion of the fire. because I want the rot to get there first before the steel gets there. So I've been trying to keep the, the, the bit of the ax furthest away from the fire flame, from the center, the core of the heat, and just trying to bring up the rest of the ax body up to that welding heat. Fallen Angel says, is welding really a need to know thing in the blacksmith shop? like modern welding? Um, modern welding. Um, I wouldn't say it's a need to know, but it is a really useful tool um, to have. There are a lot of tools that although you could forge them completely, they are a lot easier made with an electric arc weld. It's not necessary all the time. There's guys who rivet stuff together, uh, tools that need to be kind of fabricated, if you will. There's people who actually rivet things together instead of arc welding them uh, for tooling or fixtures or jigs. You know, there, there's people who do that. It's a heck of a lot easier to say, okay, I need this form and that for this type of job where I'm making this repeating element. Bzz, 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 bzz. Okay, the thing's made, lock it in my vise, and then go get on to the work uh, at hand. As far as creating the art that a blacksmith does, uh, that's completely up to the smith and how they, want, how they choose to approach their work. It is not entirely necessary that they, uh, that, that they have a, a, an, an art welder in their shop. It's a tool in your tool bag. That's the way I think about it. Is it entirely necessary for you to have a pipe wrench? <laughs> As a homeowner, I don't know. Do you ever plan on doing plumbing? Do you ever <laughs> got a rusty bolt that you've stripped to no end with a regular wrench and you got to throw on a pipe wrench to get it off, right? Well, there you go. You, you might 
just want a pipe wrench. It's just another tool in your tool bag. Uh, don't get caught up, a lot of people do, don't get caught up on the tooling. Think of it as that, it's just another tool in my tool bag. All right, I'm gonna make this weld here. All right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You've learned it, you know it well, huh? Like Thomas said, quoting me at one point in time, it is not the smith that makes the tool, it's not the tools that make the smith, it's the smith that makes the tools. See, I about screwed it up, <laughs> didn't I? Do you have that on the shirt, Jess? Uh, no, but we should. I, I would definitely buy that one. I am going to tack this thing together. Are we at the anvil? Yep. Just me, I got it from here. All right, that bit's welded in, or at least we think it is. We won't truly know until we start, <coughs> until we start actually drawing things out and then opening an eye. I'll go ahead and put that back in, get it hot again. What did everybody think of that? Pretty good? Yeah, somebody asked um, just before you went to forging on it whether you try whether you bring the heat up to what the rod iron needs or what the bet needs for forging. <coughs> Both. Both. So we're at the main cam, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So rod iron has a melting point. Steel has a melting point. Higher the carbon content, lower the melting point. Lower the carbon content higher the melting point. So they're two dissimilar metals. The best thing you can do for yourself, to, again, just giving this a really rough explanation here, the best thing that you could do for yourself is pick, when you're dealing with two different materials, you wanna pick two different materials to fuse together in welding that have very similar welding points or very close. That means you don't want to take and pick something that's going to be a liquid by the time your lower carbon content material gets to a low welding heat, right? You don't want that. So that's where I've settled into like 1045 being kind of like the glory uh, sweet spot, if you will. It's just the sweet spot because the 1045 is low enough in carbon content that it can uh, that it doesn't overheat or it's not a complete puddle by the time the wrought iron gets up to its lower welding temps, if you will. So that's why I choose 1045 and not some other thing like 5160 or, or 4140 or something like that. Plus those other materials, they do have some different alloying. They have some different elements in them that uh, can cause problems with getting your weld to stick. Not impossible, but they can cause problems with getting your weld to stick. I need to get this. Readjusted. Need to adjust my reins. Beautiful. Yeah. 
that'll hold it tighter. What? Oh, it will. Good. Eddard asks how often you use scrap metal and how you distinguish it from uh, new metal. Uh, scrap material. <laughs> well, right now I'm using it a lot more than I have in um, previous years. Uh, for YouTube, I basically almost always use scrap material uh, for my customers' work, uh, customers' orders, things like that. It depends on the job. Uh, but I mainly use scrap material in my own tooling. And then I use brand spanking new material for any client's tooling and or projects. So, generally speaking. Uh, reason why is I'm usually getting paid fairly well. And if it's something that needs to be exact, I don't want to fiddle with trying to take a truck spring and draw it out to some new shape or reshape it or size it if I don't have to. If I've got the right size stock and material, I'm gonna use the brand new stock and material just so this way I can get on with the work because my labor is higher than what the cost of material is, generally speaking, uh, when I sell my iron work. That is not always the case. Sometimes it's the material that's way higher than my, than my labor cost. Uh, like in the instance when I, when I do uh, bird baths, large bird baths or baptismal basins. Uh, when I do those, it is the material <laughs> that is way higher than my labor cost. And, uh, and for that, if I can find scrap that still gets the same job done, I'll use the scrap. But in general, I have to buy brand new, so it's pricey, very pricey. So it's a constant balance, it's a cat and mouse game. You're constantly chasing numbers around. Um, when you're just selling something, let's say, for instance, you're not trying to uphold a certain uh, standard. You're just selling something to someone at a craft show. You made a thing, they're interested in said thing. It works to use scrap materials. If you are developing a product line, like say, hey, you're going to be Uncle Dave's best homemade, you know, Axes. We'll just go with axes, right? Just because I'm drawing a blank. You're, you're going to make the best axes in the world. Well, you're not going to do that if you're constantly sourcing weird materials with weird alloys that may or may not work with each other and, and things like that. No, you're going to get really good at picking one choice material and sticking with that nonstop. Let's go to the anvil. All right. Hold on, Thomas. Yep. I have to weld in it lightly up here first before I can have you come in. Yep. Okay, so like I said, we left extra. We left extra because that's now roasting off. If you guys can see that, that's actually roasting off. That's going to get trimmed away, and our good bit is behind that material there. <coughs> Again, let's go back to this. We here? Yep. This does not matter. This is waste material. This is going to get trimmed and this is going to get spread at much lower temperatures, not super high welding temperatures, uh, but you know, fairly close. So this portion here that's out here, this is wastage. You are sacrificing this because the wrought iron takes a higher welding point than what the 1045 can, uh, give it. So this is going to turn into a puddle by the time this is at like it's a medium level of welding. So you have to leave yourself extra so you can sacrifice a little bit 
so you have a good finished product. Hopefully that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. So now, now that we've got that accomplished, that little bit there uh, welded together, and you see it's kind of roasting off, that's no longer going to be helpful to us, that little end bit. So we're actually going to trim it off. And we're going to trim it off using the edge of the anvil and a hot cut. Just like we've been using through the whole piece. Just a little handled hot cut. We're going to use the edge of the anvil and the hot cut as like a shear. And we're going to shear off that bad material because it's no longer needed. It's only going to create sparks in the fire but it's not going to be part of the finished blade or the pieces. Would you like a question? Yeah, that's what I'm here for. All right, I was making sure you didn't need uh, intense focus there. Daniel Bible says, I only have 1084 and was going to do a hatchet with wrought iron body, but from what you say it is going to be harder, is that correct? It's a 1084 with uh, and then with wrought iron. With wrought iron. Mm -hmm. 1084, you can still get done. Uh, you're just going to, you're going to sacrifice a little bit more material to the fire because it's going to burn up more readily. Oh, because it's going to want to turn to a puddle before the rot really gets there. But the rot, you, at the low end of wrought iron's welding range, you can still make that transition happen. So, you know, 1045, 1060, 1075, 1084 up to 10, 1095 is your max out there on that. So if you can find anything with similar carbon contents to those, uh, to those listed materials, give it a shot, give it a try. Remember, the higher you climb on the carbon content, the lower its melting point. So that means it's going to, it's going to melt and turn into a puddle way quicker than the wrought iron will. Um, and like I said at the beginning, I was shifting the axe, was shifting the blade, the high carbon steel bit, out of the hottest portion of the fire, and I was bringing the body of the wrought iron up to welding temp first. And then I slipped that, carbon, that high carbon steel bit back into the fire and let it suck up that initial heat energy right before I brought it out of the fire. And so it was burning a little bit, Again, like I said it would, because we're going to sacrifice a little there. But you guys seen how um, I've got a welded bit, right? It's, it's welded in now. That's the way to do it. So shift your high carbon steel out, keep it hot, but shift it out of the center of the hottest portion of the fire until your body comes up to that welding temperature, and then pull it back in, give it a couple turns, and once it starts sparking off, go ahead and weld it up you should get a pretty good weld. All right, Thomas, we're going to start right here on the edge of the anvil. Go ahead. Good. See that all right? Uh huh, sure can. It's looking pretty good, huh? It is. Decent. The weld line's gone. Now I'm going to dress it up with the hand hammer and probably the flatter. Mm -hmm. Just dress, dress that welded area up a bit more, that edge. No. AV Farm says, is making an axe with a mild steel bo body better than using a wrought iron body? <coughs> um, hmm. 
So it's kind of balance, right? So it's, it's a bit of a balance. I wouldn't say it's better. You get some trade-offs. Mild steel can take the heat a lot higher uh, or, or can take the heat, bet, well, can take the heat, it, it's closer, right? Closer in carbon content than wrought iron would be, right? To say a high carbon steel. Uh, but the trade-off you get with that, and this is unfortunate or fortunate depending on how, how you look at this trade-off. The unfortunate trade-off that you get with, with that transaction is mild steel is a lot tougher to work than wrought iron. So this whole thing I could probably do myself. If you've heard me a couple times, I've told Thomas like, whoa, like just lighter, right? Because you don't have to murder the thing. I mean, you don't have to, have to swing for the fences as you would on 5 8 inch thick mild steel by inch and a half wide. You'd have to swing for the fences on it to get that material to move, uh, even with a sledgehammer. But with rot, it makes you feel like, ooh, oh yeah, I'm a tough guy. Look at this, I'm moving some material. Even if you took a two inch round bar of wrought iron and wailed on it and take a two inch bar of, of round bar of mild steel, there is a huge difference. You can actually, with a hand hammer, forge out that two inch bar by yourself uh, of wrought iron. But with mild steel, not happening. Or you're gonna be very sore after you get it done, right? Um, to, to resize a chunk like that. So it's a trade off. Yes. It will work. Yes, you're closer on that welding spectrum because you brought the lower carbon content up a bit. But you just have to do what you've ha what you've got available to you. I've made I've made I've made mild steel tools with carbon steel bits welded into. Uh, mixed success with wrought iron. I've always had a weld stick, and I've always had good. Well, almost always. I've always had pretty great success rate with rot to uh, say 1045. So that's kind of why I just stick with that type of material is because it works for me and it's worked for hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of years. Um, welding a high carbon steel bit into wrought iron is nothing new. So kind of wisdom in the ages, right? Use the wisdom of those who've went before you. Tinker at Forge says, is it possible or reasonable to make wrought iron with a home foundry? Um, I think it's possible. Reasonable? Uh, I don't know if it is. It's... <laughs> it might be. <laughs> it might become more reasonable. <laughs> Again, steel prices are insane, so it might actually be a very viable option here soon, and you might have the corner on the market when it comes to it. Um, so, I, yeah, I can't say a whole lot on that end of it just because I wouldn't know what would be involved as far as scale of time that you would have into creating, say, a pound of rot or 10 pounds of rot or a half-inch square bar right, of wrought iron. I, I don't know how much time you would have into that and whether that would be worth it or not. If you could do it at scale, I think it could be. So I mean at scale as in, you know, if you had big rollers and you, and you could really pour some big stuff. If you're talking about a little home foundry, a little tiny thing where you're gonna get a nugget, probably not, probably, probably not worth it. By the time you have enough to do anything with, it would just have nostalgia value. Uncle Buck's, Uncle Buck's Forge, thank you for the $20 super chat. He says, glad I'm able to make the show tonight. Thank you, Uncle Buck, greatly appreciate it. Glad you're getting to make the show too. All right. Oh, my brother's calling me. All right, I'm gonna weld this up and then we're gonna use the flatter, okay? Thomas, I'm going to weld it. Yep. Telephone.
grab this from a different angle. Hopefully I can grab it with this. Ah! I am not able to grab it perfectly. Pick it up. We'll have to take another heat on this before we take it all the way. <coughs> Coming together, ain't it? Mm -hmm. All right. Crazy how fast that moves. Huh? It's crazy how fast that moves. Like I said, this is my first time messing with this drop. Yeah. It goes quick. <coughs> Rod iron goes quick. All right, the bit's welded in. Just like that. Ain't that fine? Mm -hmm. Ain't that fantastic? That's good, took nicely. We're kind of catching up on all our missed live streams, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've been missing quite a few of them for a while now. So it's good to catch up. Mm -hmm. AV Farm says, which do you prefer for forge welding, solid fuel, coal or coke, or gas, propane, natural gas, etc.? Uh, solid fuel, coal is my preferred for forge welding. Now, coke has its advantages, its disadvantages. Uh, right now, my personal problem with the coke that I've been buying is it's dirty. It's pretty dirty. I mean, it's clean as far as clean burning, like clean as in no smoke, but the, uh, uh, well, except for this last bag, there was a little bit of uh, Pocahontas coal thrown in the bag with it. But um, I, I would say, I would say for me, it's really about, uh, I've worked with green coal forever, like forever since I started. I've worked with Bermudamus green coal and converted coal and you know, went through the whole forging steps and process to uh, create a, a welding fire in that. So I like that better. It requires less air, unlike a coke fire. A coke fire, you have to supply constant airflow to it. Uh, I don't like that as much with that, so. Granddad says, hey Roy, I'm moving a railroad clip for a scythe or RR clip. I'm guessing that's railroad. Probably yeah, railroad will need, clip. Probably will need an arm transplant. Can I have one of yours? <laughs> no, you can have one of Thomas's though. <laughs> it's kind of puny. <laughs> he's got bigger arms than me. I better shut up. He'll beat me up. <laughs> Somebody was saying earlier, he's the one who holds the big hammer, so you better watch it. <laughs> that's Thomas. He bullied his way into my shop. <laughs> I didn't bully yeah. He put me in a headlock and gave me a noogie. He's like, you will accept help. <laughs> you like, will be my friend. I'm like, fine, just stop hitting me. <laughs> nah, if I didn't like Thomas, you wouldn't see him. Trust me. <laughs> I like Thomas pretty well. Well, I'm a pretty likable guy. Easy now. Easy. Easy. Don't, don't overstep. Whoa now. Watch now. <laughs> Got a little gappage there on the rot I want to weld up. So got to wait for it to come up to heat. Back up, really that that inside. little back end closer to the thing. I want to bring it up to a welding heat and close it up and then drive it down over this. I don't know if that gentleman from earlier is still watching that the uh you know took starting out and he's asked a lot of questions. Does failed attempts don't don't count them as failures. Um the gentleman that was talking earlier just getting new into this, you know, talking about failed attempts and stuff, don't count them as failures, man. Take them as learning steps 
what you can gain from that. What did you do right? What did you do wrong? Um, believe me, I'm, I definitely make my fair share of mistakes too. And I, I ask Roy a hundred questions because uh, he has a lot more years on this than I do. And, uh, you know, call him up. Hopefully, you know, you might be able to hop in other people's lives and stuff like that that's doing this and ask the questions because there's no such thing as a stupid question, you know. And uh, like I said, failed attempts are not really failures. They're just something to learn from. Well said, Thomas, well said. <clears throat> Daniel Crawford says, can Roy explain the importance of knowing grain structure alignment prior to punching and drifting? Okay, for wrought iron? Uh-huh. Yeah, I can explain that. Let me take this heat real quick to weld on this a little bit, and then I will explain that. Okay. See it right there. I'm gonna have to, yeah, I'll have to get it good and hot again. No, I just want that welded. It's not a problem. I could leave it, but I just want that. I want that portion welded. While we're here. Here. Oh. So we got a bend in it. So we've created a little bit of a bend in it by our actions. Might actually have to put it up on something here. There we go. Still got spreading to do. Still got a little bit of spreading to do, but there's some other parts we need to work on first. All right, uh, let's talk real quick. And I think, what, what time is it, hon? Uh, 7.31. Okay, let's, uh, let's call it it on this process for this evening on this. Uh, this is a good stopping, good stopping point. I need to get more weld back here. I, I, I want to weld up this eye a bit more behind this blade just to prevent any splitting open that may occur. Um, you know, this will need to be drawn out in width. It'll need to be widened. The eye will need to be stretched and drifted quite a bit. Uh, so all that's to come, right? All, we'll, we'll do all that in future, uh, future streams. But that's good enough for one evening. That's a fully welded up thing. You can see that uh, high carbon steel bit right here. There's an overlap because of how tall it was. That's fine. This is going to spread and then that's going to get ground out. So this is going to want to spread up this way while we draw this down, this little bit of a beard down in here, nice square beard. By the time we draw this down a little bit, this material is going to spread up and it's all going to get ground off the top. Along with this material, this material is going to go up and when we grind it to get it all square across the top, uh, or perfectly square across the top, that little bit will disappear. So that's just an overlap that's happened because too much material squatting down and not really fully welding in. Which is okay. We can do that. That's what we want. We've got our end trimmed. This will get ground, obviously, to a blade edge, so none of this is going to matter for, for the profiling. Can they see all this okay? Uh -huh. Is it reasonable? Mm -hmm. Okay. So all this is going to get profiled at some point. Uh, I, want, I like to forge as close to finish as possible when I forge on things. 
Uh, it takes a high degree. It takes a higher degree of skill level to fully forge something to almost a finished state, and then do as light a grinding as possible. Why? I hate grinding. <laughs> I do. I, I really hate grinding. So we'll pick this up in another stream. But I want to answer some questions. Crawford posed a great one. So I want to answer that one real quick. <coughs> because there may have been a few people who have asked or asked themselves, why is he doing a wrapped thing, right, with the wrought iron? And uh, this, is a great, this is a great place to kind of point that out of why I'm doing what I'm doing. Back in the main cam? Yep. Okay. So the reason why I have chosen to do a wrapped eye on the wrought iron in the historical precedence of why most axe eyes that were wrought, wrought iron axes, had wrapped eyes on it is for two separate points, two separate points I'll put out. The first of which is it's a lot easier to take a strap of material and make an eye and just weld it to a bit. Again, welding was like water to blacksmiths back in the day. They did it all the time. They had no arc welders, so they got really good at doing forge welds, right? And their materials were really conducive to making forge welded items. Really were. Wrought iron loves to be welded to itself through the forging process. So, so that's, that's number one. It's easier to take a strap of iron, spin it around something and attach it and then make a blade out of, you, you know, make a blade out of it. Then it is to take a big chunk and punch and spend a lot of labor of drifting a hole through it. The second reason why that axes are created this way is because when you punch wrought iron, it doesn't perform like mild steel. Because there's grain orientation, like a chunk of wood, when you punch down through, say with something like a slitting tool, where it's a long slot, and then you drift something open in that grain, what are you doing? You're splitting along the seam of that grain, right? And so therefore, what would happen is at the very end, as you see on the pole of the axe back here, it would split out. So they just didn't do it. It's not the, not, not the right way of doing it. If you're making a project in wrought iron and you're wanting to punch a hole into it, just a round hole, keep in mind how the grain is flowing through the piece is very important. If you get too far out to an edge, it will split out nine times out of 10. It'll split out on an edge. It'll pop apart. And then you're gonna to try to weld it and do all this other stuff. That's why you'll see in a lot of early iron pieces, you will see where they wrapped around and re-welded something back. They drew out a tongue and then folded it back on itself and re-welded it, right? <coughs> they did that because it's not possible for you to punch and drift a hole on the end of a bar of rot because of the grain, the wood grain-like structure, the fibrous grain. Also, when you're making an item from wrought iron, <coughs> you always are thinking, just like in woodwork, how your grain is running, what direction and what flow that grain is running. Because it's not like homogenized steel, um, like modern mild steel would be, or you know, high carbon steel or whatever you're working with, it's not the same. It's not the same. It doesn't have um, this really tightly interwoven and locking together grain structure like a homogenized steel. It has this, <laughs> it has this very stringy um, and long grain structure to it, just like wood. So you have to keep in mind where that's at when you're bending stuff. <coughs> um, that's where the thing about sharp corners came in, believe it or not. We do it now just as a method, method of habit of radiusing anvil edges, right? People will say, oh, you got to radi uh, radius all your anvil edges and, and, you know, to prevent cold shuts. Actually, camera, uh, careful hammer work is what prevents cold shuts, not necessarily radiused edges of your anvil. Uh, the, the anvil's edges get radiused heavily back in the day because wrought iron, if you were to put a sharp 
edge and pound on a chunk of two by four, you start breaking those grains, right? Right at the end, you start snapping them. Have you ever seen somebody use a power hammer with sharp dies on a chunk of wood like a two by four? That's what happens to the wrought iron. And so smiths of old and all the ways that the industry happened, the way that they took care to do certain things, it was because of the material that they were working with. They were always paying attention to the grain, where the grain was running in the wrought iron. And you'll find that most pieces of iron back in the day, they follow a grain, a very specific grain structure, a flow, a direction, scrolls, right? Because if you get a piece of wrought iron, say it's got like my fingers here, and you forge on it in this direction, you're just packing those grains closer and closer together and they'll stretch out, they'll elongate. But if you go like this from this direction and you hammer on them, they just spread out, right? They just get wider and wider apart and they wanna pop apart. So you always have to keep that in mind when you're welding. Uh, when you're welding, forging, drilling, punching, uh, twisting, right? You don't wanna be twisting along two planes, on a shear plane, right? That wrought iron's like a shear plane. It's got all those strands running in one direction. If you start twisting in an opposite direction, you're gonna peel it apart. <coughs> Every time. Hopefully that answers the question in detail. Mm -hmm. Just let this normalize. Would everybody give Thomas a round of applause in the comment section and thank him for being such a great help, such a great striker this evening. That, this makes quick work of it when you have help. If I have to do this by myself, I, can use the, I could use the fly press and the power hammer, but I gotta set up tooling and all this other stuff. It is so much quicker to just have an extra hand that you can just be like, okay, hit it there, and twist it there, and you know, make his hand. You step in front while they applaud you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> We're assuming they're applauding too. Yeah, <laughs> Philip oh, Urban is. There's, yep. there's a bunch of applause. Yep. Heat this up one more time. Let it normalize again. And then we'll let it anneal. Just so this way it's nice and easy and we relax that high carbon steel. This is like the time of the evening when the Delilah show comes on, right? Everybody hmm? relaxes. You relax. <laughs> oh, yeah. Delilah. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I don't even know what radio station that was on. I don't know. Does Probably anybody remember not. what station that Delilah would come on in the <laughs> evening? Late night? Well, not really that late. No. What about midnight? 1130? Yeah, it's late enough for a lot 12? of people. <laughs> Yeah, she was like, you're listening to whatever, whatever, Delilah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just remember the tune. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm trying to get home from work. <laughs> you know, I was always traveling at that time and I would only find these soothing radio people while I'm driving home, you know? It's like mm -hmm. at midnight from a day where I've worked, just put in, you know, 18 hours and it's like, the yeah, the soothing sounds on my 45 minute drive home, trying to run me off the road. <laughs> Jeffrey Rudinger says, no idea. I don't think I've heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably because he's young. It might be an Ohioan <laughs> thing, huh? J. A C. local? JC Purvost says 96.1. 96.1. Delilah. Oh, Debaca says Delilah was syndicated. <laughs> was syndicated? Yeah. What's that? <laughs> like, like it goes all over the states. <laughs> That's what I thought. Is I thought I've heard heard his stuff on multiple radio stations. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fun stuff. Man, this was a fun Houston. project. I'm glad my my thoughts have come out so far. We'll see how we'll see how far it goes. Uh, Hopefully I can draw out the cheeks and all that stuff. Um, yeah, ho hopefully that'll all work out good. We'll see once we get to the drifting. 
that's kind of where the whole thing, that's where the cookie's gonna crumble, right? If it's gonna split open, it's gonna split open at the drifting. As, as soon as we start shoving a drift through there, it's mm -hmm. gonna, that's a lot of stress on that weld in the shear plane. It's wanting to pull it apart. Um, and so anywhere where it's not quite welded, if it can get it, if it can start a crack, it will, and it's gonna open it up. So we're gonna have to be real, real genteel like to make sure that that stays welded and, and clean, good clean while we drift things open. Yeah. That'll be the proof in the tapioca. Oh yeah, proof in the tapioca. <laughs> in the pudding. Right in the pudding. <laughs> <laughs> so many bad thoughts. <laughs> so many bad imageries. That came, with, that came with that statement, Thomas. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> so bad. He's in there. Is that right in the pudding? <laughs> Kevin James, lead with the pudding cup. <laughs> yeah, lead with the pudding cup. <laughs> Remove all mystery. <laughs> yeah. Remove all mystery. <laughs> well, if it comes out well, I think the boy will like it. What do you think, huh? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 He'll love it no matter what, yeah. you know. Mama's not completely sold on the idea of the boy having an axe, so. <laughs> it's gonna be supervised. It can hang yeah. decoratively in the shop when it's not in use. Yeah, he'll be being supervised by me, so you know it'll <laughs> be all right. <laughs> right? Uh-huh. Right. He has Jesus with him all the time. Mm -hmm. Supervised. <laughs> what? But no one ever said you had to make it to heaven with all your fingers and toes, though. So. <laughs> no. All right, that's cool. We're going to set that right there. Shut her off. Aura Loon says that uh, there in Minnesota, she's wearing shorts and flip-flops, and it's 40 degrees. <laughs> right on. <laughs> we'll be like that here in Michigan soon. No, oh, very soon, if it's not already. Yeah, let's give away yeah, some things, huh? Yeah. Let's end the evening on a high note. What do you think? Yeah, let's do that. So first off, before we give something away, I'm going to talk just a bit more. Surprise, surprise. I just want to say thank you to each and every last one of you that joined us this evening in the Friday Night Live stream. I want to thank especially everyone who's chosen to support this channel and what we do here at Christ Center Ironworks, Jessica and I, um, with with all of your super chat donations, with all of your channel memberships, like just stuff like that goes a huge long way. Um, here recently, we've been quite blessed to have several people buy uh, blanks from us, you know, our, at our blacksmithingblanks.com website, you know, and that just helps keep this whole thing funded and really can't thank you enough. So you all are responsible for the giveaways and you're responsible for the, um, yeah, paying for all the shipping and things like that. And we couldn't, we literally honestly couldn't do it without you. So thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, and, and because of that, because of that, I think we're going to have one of the most epic Christmas giveaway live streams we've ever had this year. Uh, we've had some pretty epic ones in the past. I know Epic gets used a lot and thrown mm. around uh, the internet a pinch too much, <laughs> a pinch too much, but I really do think so because, yeah, it's part of our budget every month. We set a little bit back for the Christmas giveaway live stream, and we've been setting back all year long, so it's going to be great, I think. It's going to be, it's going to be good. Oh, yeah. It's going to be it good. Is, definitely. It'll be real good this year, so, but... Anyways, enough me yammering on about that. I want to say thank you to Greg over at Holland Anvil and Hobie. Thank you so much for helping partner with us to get these swedge blocks out there, out into the hands of the mini. So greatly, greatly appreciate that. Are you on that screen? Mm -hmm. Boom. Okay. So this is the swedge block that we're going to give away. We're gonna go ahead and give that away and then followed by a couple more door prizes uh, for those of you who wanna stick around for that. 
but we'll go ahead and draw for that. That is open to people in the United States. Unfortunately, to all my international friends, it's just too cost prohibitive for us to get it out there internationally. So I hope you can understand. It's just kind of the way things work. So, and if it wasn't, and if it wasn't for the shipping being costly, it would probably be customs duties and all the other things that they would throw on it too as well, the taxes and craziness. So it would be quite expensive to ship it internationally. So hopefully you all understand. Again, it is open to people in the United States. We ready? Yes, we are. Let's draw for it. Are right, they commenting? Um, are we, wait, wait, wait. Are we just going for the swedge block or are we gonna like warm up to it with like some of the smaller? Oh no, smaller we're gonna go pieces. for the swedge block right okay. now. Okay, we're, let me give them a heads so, up. So we are going for the swedge block right now. Once Jessica finishes giving you all a heads up in the <coughs> in the comment section, maybe Thomas, I don't even know what he's doing. He's out there, he's spamming it up right now. If he wins, trust me, it's completely at random. It's not, it's not rigged. That's right. <laughs> oh, but uh, we'll just exclude him. We'll pick somebody else. Oh, hey. <laughs> Never just, to do you. Yeah, just cause, just cause he's here. So. <laughs> I have just as much luck as you guys versus being here or sitting on my couch. Yeah. Are we ready? Are okay. they common in swedge block? Mm -hmm. Swedge me or They're whatever. Swedge, swedge baby, swedge. <laughs> they got all sorts of swedge going on. Swedge huh? fast. Swedge fast. <laughs> What? I need a swedge. I think they're just trying to auto-type. Yeah. They're something. starting to get in an unintelligible with their That's typing, right. huh? They're going yes. so fast. All right. We ready? Mm -hmm. Let's do this. This is for the 10th Holland Anvil Swedge Block in the Year of the Swedge giveaways uh, this year. Let's go. Who do we have? Eddie Smith with Swedge. Hey, hey, Eddie Smith. Congratulations. You are the winner this month of the Holland Anvil Swedge Block. You've got 24 hours, sir, to get us your contact uh, information through the contact email in the description down below. Be sure to do that and we will get that shipped out to you as pronto as we can. Well, we'll get Holland paid and then they'll ship it out to you when they can. <laughs> That's the way it works. So again, big round of applause for Holland and uh, thank you again for that. So if you are upset, said, wait a second, I lost out on my chance. We've got two more to go this year. And we haven't decided fully what next year will be. We have not. Yet. We no. haven't. We still, haven't decided yet. But still percolating. We've got plenty of cool giveaway live streams still yet to go. All right. What's next? Are we ready? Yes, we are. OK. Are we doing Tom Tongs? Yep, we're going to do Tom Tongs from Blacksmith Supply. All right. Now, Blacksmith Supply is a kind of a new partner on the channel. Uh, it getting involved just like, just like Holland Anvil's been getting a part of the channel uh, for quite some time here now. Uh, and they actually, Blacksmith Supply sent these to us free of charge so we can give them away. So are we at the secondary cam? Voila. Now we are. <laughs> uh, so they actually gave us these Tom Tongs to give away. These are half inch bolt jaw tongs. These are ridiculously nice tongs. Mm -hmm. Super, super nice. Uh, these are actually very, very affordable over there at their website. I've used them in my shop now for, I don't know, months. And again, they're just good quality tongs. So really nice tongs. So if you do go over to their website and purchase any of these, you won't be sorry you did uh, for sure. They, they're really nicely put together. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're gonna give away. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Blacksmith Supply, for sending these out. And uh, there's going to be some more of, you'll, you'll hear Blacksmith Supply again in the future. They're going to be partnering with us again, So which is going to be super awesome. Like I said, Christmas is going to be good <laughs> this year. All right. Say something with tongs in the title. Mm -hmm. You've been warned. 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 <laughs> You've been warned. <laughs> See? I told you. Grammar. Let's do it. <laughs> Who do we have? We have Blob Mania with tongs. What? 
Blob Mania. Blob Mania? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jessica with her pronunciations. I just tried. <laughs> Blob Mania. Congratulations. You won the Tom Tongs. Here. <laughs> so get with us. Contact email. Or we'll give them to somebody else. 24 hours. That's the deal. Do it. Do, Do it, it now. <laughs> I don't think ever since ever since that was like a meme thing get started no one can ever say do it without <laughs> saying it in that arnold yeah. schwarzenegger you, voice you so like you have to given. exactly it's a given you have to do that are we still at the secondary cam nope but i can go there all right let's go to the secondary cam so the next one we're going to be giving away are these that were purchased with all of the great channel members money <laughs> and all the <laughs> all the super chatters money uh, we're going to give away these pair of flat jaw tongs with this little rivet here. They're a kit. They're like a quick tong kit that you can put together yourself. And uh, yeah, we're going to roll with it, right? Mm -hmm. Tong to tong, tong, tong. <laughs> Jessica smiles every time I say that. That's funny. Go ahead. Who we got? We have Chris Hendry with tongs. Hey, Chris Hendry. Congratulations. You are the winner of the flat jaw tongs. Are we back to the main cam? Now we are. <laughs> I can only write so fast. Ah, you can only write so fast. Mm -hmm. I'm making her shift all around. That's right. Oh, we also got two blanks to take and give away. Mm -hmm. Christmas ornaments, actually. And These are not our original design. Well, the Santa head is. The Santa head is, is but the, the gnome is, is not. We actually had a subscriber. Are we, are we at the main cam still? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we, actually had a, we actually had a subscriber that reached out with us, uh, reached out to us with something that he came up with, mm -hmm. right? First uh, name I don't Dan. know. Huh? Dan is his first name. We could Dan, say that we'll much. just say Dan mm -hmm. is his first name. He reached out to us with something that he came up with and said, hey, I just want to give you guys the idea and say that you can use it if you wanted to to make something. And we thought it was a really great, neat, inventive way of making a Christmas ornament. So we turned them into blanks that we sell over at blacksmithingblanks.com. And so we're going to give away uh, some of those now. We're going to give, well, two different ones away. We've got a gnome and we also got a Santa head. And let's go to camera number two, Jessica. Right. And I'll show off what they do. So okay. can they see this all right mm -hmm. from that distance? Yeah, that that's decent? fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, you've got your gnome shape with your gnome beard, and you use a button rivet as the nose. I can't hold it all together. So you use the, you use the button rivet as a nose. So you can pop in eyes and texture his beard out or whatever and make a little gnome or a little elf, if you will, uh, you know, Christmas ornament. Pretty darn cool. That was the original idea. And then Jessica up the ante. Yes. With, like do a Santa. Yeah, with a Santa <laughs> Claus type thing. Same thing, button nose. A mustache. Button nose, mustache, that whole bit. So this way you can end up making a Santa head. <laughs> you know, we could always do a Roy face too. <laughs> oh Lord. Like, do a Roy face. <laughs> do a Roy face. Oh, man. That would no. be hilarious. That's bad. So, yeah. So, so these are our new ornaments that we have. We have a ton of new ornaments, actually, over at the website now. But this is a multi-part ornament, which is kind of cool, kind of fun to put together. So, we're going to do the gnome first, Jess. Okay. And we're going to give one of those away right now. Yep. And then that'll lead me back to my last FYI for everybody okay. um, for, for the evening. So, we're going to do the gnome first. We're at the main camp. Let's go to the main cam. We're going to go ahead and draw for the gnome now. Okay. I just can't imagine what the comment section is. Gnome me. Oh, yeah. All kinds yeah. of stuff. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. Winning gnome. Winning gnome. <laughs> Santa Roy. <laughs> Somebody said Santa Roy. Santa Roy. All right. Ready? Let's draw for the gnome Christmas ornament. All right. Who do we have? We have... 
see I'm looking for the first one that says no. You can come stand over here, Thomas. You don't have to stay oh, hidden oh, anymore. Oh, where'd it go? Oh, anymore. The, the, the numbers are down. <laughs> you can show his face again. <laughs> All right, Brent Daughtery. Santa, Roy, gnome, please. Brent, Brent? Daughtery. Daughtery? Mm -hmm. Yep. Congratulations. You won the little gnome ornament. So congratulations. Get with us. Contact email down in the description. And I'll get that sent out to you pronto. Pronto. Now the illustrious Thomas is going to hold up the Santa <laughs> ornament. And we're going to draw for that now. Way to drop the button nose. <laughs> Not the button Gosh. Not can't find good drop help. Buttons. <laughs> <laughs> can't find good help these days. What's going on? All right. We ready? Mm-hmm. Now this one is for the Santa ornament. Ready? Mm-hmm. Go. <laughs> Who do we have? Let's see, our first Santa is David Walker with Santa. David Walker, congratulations, you won the Santa ornament. You know the deal? Down in the description down below. Everybody give everybody a round of applause, all the winners, and Don't all that good stuff. We did huh? say we were going to do a few sticker packs. Oh, we we're going to do well. a few sticker mm -hmm. packs too? Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Did you want to draw all names for that? or? Um, yes, give me a second to give them heads up. We don't have them. All right, we don't have them present, but we're going to give away a few sticker packs as well with the Year yeah. of the Swedge Block sticker in them. Brought to us by Dana Maggiore. Yep, brought to you by Dana Maggiore. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dana. <laughs> we ready? Sure. We're going to draw for the first sticker pack. <laughs> Who do we have? All right, the first one. <laughs> I'm waiting for the lag to end. They're still talking about Santa. Oh, they're still okay. lag? Possum Sausage. Possum sausage, congratulations! You get a sticker pack. You know I the deal. I don't know how I came across that name though. Possum sausage. How do you think, Thomas? <laughs> 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 Making sausage from possums. <laughs> Duh. Duh. <laughs> All right. Quality entertainment. Let's go for sticker pack number two. <laughs> Who do we have? We have Chuck Miller with stickers. Chuck with Miller, Z. congratulations. You are another winner of our sticker packs. Mm -hmm. And one more. One Sound more. Good? All right. Yep. Let's do it. <laughs> Who do we have? Carl Moore with stickers. Carl Moore mm -hmm. stickers. Congratulations, Carl Moore. Mm -hmm. um, again, everybody, please contact us within 24 hours mm -hmm. with your email. Uh, with your contact information, just as Jessica has it all written out in the description, I'm mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. Follow the steps, do that. We will get this stuff shipped out to you as soon as possible. We usually try to ship everything out Monday. That's kind of our day after a live stream. We kind of ship, we prepare it during the weekend and we get it shipped out Monday. So, um, so please get with us so we can do that and get it off of our roster. Uh, we, we like to do that and stay fairly quick at those things. Um, also, so this is like a FYI moment. Um, it, it's kind of like a little bit of update around the CNC plasma cutting and stuff like the blanks and whatnot. So here recent, we've had to change our supply, uh, our supplier of steel for the uh, plasma cut blanks. And the reason for that being is when we were buying at Alro Steel up in Alpena, we were buying our plate steel, brand new plate steel originally for about a hundred and a quarter to a hundred and a half is what we were paying for per four by eight sheet of plate. That was fine. We still were able to make, you know, turn a small profit on things when, you know, when people use discount codes and everything else, we were able to, you know, hold our head above water at that. Well, since then, the price has jumped up to nearly $400 a plate now. Uh, for the same size plate, same thickness, same everything, it's $400 a plate. So we ended up having to go use scrap. That question came up earlier, right? It came up earlier. So what we did is we went down to the scrap yard down Dayton, shout out to First Street Recycling, uh, super huge fans of them. We were, we were able to take and get a good amount of steel purchased in for a, like a tenth of that cost. So we are using scrap steel to cut our blanks now, which means they're going to be kind of rusty or they might have, you know, a couple little surface imperfections or things like that. If it's real bad, I chuck them. I, I don't, you know, 
I cut around bad spots or things like that. So just be, be advised that the product quality has got to suffer somewhat in order for me to maintain the same level pricing that everything's been because nobody wants to spend 40 bucks on a Christmas ornament blank, no. right? No one's going to do that. I don't expect people to do that. So that's the only way that we are able to still stay viable, buy more steel, make more blanks, fund more giveaway stuff, buy more things, afford shipping. It's a big mess, a tangle web we weave, but we have to do that. So just to be, just be advised, if you do go over and buy any blanks from us, um, there will be a mix. You might, whoa, that's a rusty blank. Well, it's because it's from used steel. And by the time you throw it in the forge and you heat it up and beat it, you'll never know that it was uh, from scrap material. Still the same thickness. It's still good steel. It's just bought at a cheaper price from somewhere else. We can't do brand new. I refuse to pay $400 a sheet for something I was paying a hundred and a quarter for. In fact, in Dayton, I was paying $80 a sheet for a four by eight sheet when we got this whole thing started. Mm. I'm not paying $400 a sheet, so I refuse. Alro can <laughs> go jump off a bridge for all I care. Just not, just not gonna do that. Alro, if you're watching this or somebody from Alro and you wanna talk, sure, let's talk. But until then, keep raising prices and eventually you're gonna get stuck holding all the steel. So that's my, that's my message to all you steel manufacturers out there. You best be thinking. Don't, yeah. don't stick it to the little guy. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not going to work out. My last interaction, I'll just I'll put it this way. My last interaction, there was quite a bit of arrogance. If you don't like the price now, just wait in a month. So you better buy it now. Because it's only going to go up from here. I'm like, oh, really? Well, if people stop buying... I guess that price is going to plummet, ain't it? <laughs> so at at four hundred dollars a sheet, hey, somebody's got more money than cents, they can go after it. But we can't sell blanks at that price. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah. So that's my little story, my little soapbox. So just make everybody aware that's our attempt at staying marketably viable. Yep. What's going on, babe? Um. Oh, they're asking what gauge. Okay, so the gauge that most of our blanks are cut from is 10 gauge material or eighth inch thick steel. Um, and then our, like all of our flower blanks, they're cut from thinner stuff. It's posted right on the website what gauge material and thicknesses mm -hmm. that things are, that individual blanks are made from. The majority of all the blanks though are fairly thick material. So <coughs> just like these ornaments, these ornaments are 10 gauge material. But if you notice, they were kind of rusty, right? Let's go to camera number two real quick. I'll just show you. So this is what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I'd rather that be perfect mill scale, right? But you can still forge that and you'll never know mm -hmm. that that was ever rusty like that, right? So that's kind of what I'm talking about. I hate doing that, but I, I like perfectly shiny blanks when I send them to people. But it kind of is what it is. To get a perfect shiny blank, this thing costs, like I said, 10x mm -hmm. what, it, what it costs. I think we're selling these, what, four, five bucks? Four dollars. Uh, yeah, five for the kits. Y yeah. yeah, it's five bucks for a kit. So we can go back mm -hmm. over to the main camp. So I mean, we sell those for five bucks each, right? Mm -hmm. And just imagine the material cost costing 10 times more. Would anybody spend 10 times more <laughs> on this blank? Mm -hmm. Nobody would, right? Nobody would. So, uh, so, so we went down. So, so I worked some deals. We've got to run on steel where we can get steel and still keep the whole thing going. And uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes in the future. Yep. That's right. So mm -hmm. right now, if you're suffering like everybody else is with steel and expensive prices, right now is not the time to be a big ornamental iron worker guy where, where you're installing thousand foot of railing. Right now is not your time uh, to do that. Focus on your small stuff, little things, trinket items, craft fair, giftable things, and anniversaries. It's that time of year too. So. Yep, and it's getting that time of year. So um, that's the only way to force the big guys into uh, <laughs> having to lower their prices. So just, do, just don't succumb to it. Don't pay it. Find your used stuff.
or make small stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's my final thoughts on that. Yeah. Anyways, what's going on? The Baca Maker says, don't worry about rust. Don't worry about the rust? Yep, don't worry about it. Fallen Angel nope. says, rust comes off. Yep, it sure does. Crawford says, can't do $50 gnomes. <laughs> no, uh, no, no one can. <laughs> I can't. I can't do $50 gnomes. I wouldn't feel mm -hmm. right selling it that, so. Mm -hmm. so. So that's always the thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you either close up shop and say, okay, well, I'm no longer doing that anymore. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Or you find other ways around it. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it seems like everybody, everybody's way of doing it, and it, it makes sense, it's business, is to pass the buck. Right? Oh, you know, Walmart charged me this price, so I'm going to turn around and, you know, charge this to someone else because, well, we can do it, and we just got to pass the buck along, right? But it's got to stop somewhere at some point. And uh, I refuse being in the kind of the manufacturing side of things with doing the blanks and, and stuff. I refuse to pass those savings on to um, people who watch the channel. I, I just don't want to do it that way. It's meant to be a cheap way of starting a business as a blacksmith. You start with blanks and you sell these things at craft shows and internet. And like that was the whole kind of theory on it to begin with, right? To be helpful in that way and not make it extremely <laughs> outrageously expensive, you know? Mm -hmm. Like our skillets are our most expensive item on our website. And, but to be fair, <laughs> to, be fair. <laughs> to be fair, as Troy would say, and Eli, <laughs> those, those can sell for anywhere from $100 a pop all the way up to some people are selling skillets for three, 400 bucks you know, once they've got a name established and a business established and stuff. So spending 20 bucks on a skillet kit really isn't that bad if you're gonna sell, turn around and sell it for a hundred bucks, a hundred and a quarter. But that's a really steep price climb if I have to sell that same skillet kit for $65. Because that's how much steel, <laughs> that's how much the value of the, just the steel is and at that I'm breaking even. So, so yep. So anyways, there you go. Just want to let you know, enough of that dribble drabble. I know a lot of people will jump in at the end of the stream, watch it on the replay. So I thank you all uh, for watching. Thank you, Thomas. Yes, Greatly appreciate you. it, brother, for all the Always hard striking. Pleasure. Yep. And uh, you got anything else to say, Jessica? No, not particularly. No? Everyone's good? <laughs> yeah. Looks like we're getting some rain in. We are, yeah. And you know what's not happening right now? Uh, it's not blowing in the big hole up top. It's not blowing in on me. <laughs> Yay! Yay! <laughs> T-Rex arms. Yay! <laughs> Where's Yama's? <Yalmez? laughs> I am so thankful for that. So, yeah, I was able to use the lift. If anybody follows us on Instagram and plug mm -hmm. up a big hole in the siding up there. So, so no more rain directly on my shoulders. Thank God for that. Huh. Exactly. And hydraulics. <laughs> yeah. That made it all possible. So <laughs> that's it for today. Thank you guys so much. God bless each and every last one of you. Um, be sure to check out the description for all the links and the schedule for the next live stream, all that jazz. Mm -hmm. And uh, we look forward to catching you all on the next one as we get closer to Christmas. <laughs> Christmas lives. As you can see, I'm growing out the beard for something special, a special little treat. So, yes, this is like six months of growth, okay? <laughs> Unlike Thomas over here. No, this is a while. That's this, a while? This All is right. a while. Well, no. last time I had it trimmed up, the, the barber's like, what happened? I was like, oh, I, I got a little close to some fire. <laughs> My whole side was singed up pretty good. Yeah. So... You know, big beards are nice, but be careful when you're around the hot fire. As I'm sure most of them know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> oh. All right. Take care, everybody. God bless you. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks so much for watching.